All right, good afternoon, everybody. It is now afternoon by just a few seconds, uh, and we will try to start on time. Marie's not here. She'll never believe that I got started on time without her, so you will have to take up for me if she, uh, if she questions me. Um, I want to start uh, this meeting and, and all meetings going forward, if, it, if it's okay with the group, uh, with a moment of silence. Um, in honor and memory of those out there suffering from this disease and the families uh, that are suffering uh, in silence. Thank you. All right. Thanks to everyone for coming down to Jackson on this lovely day. Uh, drives in across the state, and we have such a beautiful state. None of us got to see it this morning, unfortunately, uh, through the fog. But uh, hopefully uh, I'm grateful that everybody got here safely. And Tarn Sloss uh, will be here in uh, just a moment. Um, I want to start out, and I know people don't like this, but we've got, we've got to get to know each other. I think I know everybody at the table, and I actually know some people around the ring as well. But at least in our inner ring here on the on the council, if you would, uh, introduce yourself, uh, what you do. And uh, before we get started, I'm going to give a, a pre-intro to the to the gentleman way down to my left who looks suspicious. Uh, his name is Kurt Hippel. Uh, he looks suspicious because he's an attorney. And uh, Kurt is actually the assistant commissioner of uh, planning policy and legislation. He's actually part of our uh, part of our agenda here today. And I worked with Kurt when I was uh, with the state. Um, Kurt kept me out of a lot of trouble. Um, Kurt's one of the most honest and, and good people I've ever met. Um, and I told him if he ever runs for office, I'll go to door to door canvassing for him. I'm not sure if I can say that or not, but I will. Uh, so Kurt, if, if you would introduce yourself when he gets to you, and we're, we're really glad to have you. And I am, I am grateful you're here. So I'll start to my left with Brian. Hi, um, my name is Brian Buck. Uh, I'm the CEO at Ridgeview and Ridgeview is a community mental health center and psychiatric hospital that uh, serves uh, eight counties in East Tennessee. It's good to be here. Thanks, Brian. Good to have you. Thank you for that. Welcome, Dr. Lloyd. I'm glad to be here with you all today. I'm Kurt Hippel. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Planning Policy and Legislation with the Department. I see a lot of familiar faces in the room um, that are working hard on this problem. So thank you all for letting me present to you all today. Thanks, Kurt. Tom. Tommy Farmer, Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Sharm Allen, Knox County District Attorney General. Yeah. Timothy Fournette, cardiologist at Cookville, Tennessee. Wayne Wyckoff, Knoxville Attorney. Right. Monica Fontes, retired sheriff out of Cook County, White Pine Police Department. Thanks, Monica. Yeah, Ken Moore, Mayor of Franklin, Tennessee. Shane Sachs, a retired uh, state judge. Karen Pershing, Metro Drug Coalition out of Knoxville. <coughs> Clay Jackson, palliative care physician in Memphis. Mary Shelton, Executive Director of the Opioid Abatement Council. And I'm Stephen Lloyd, an addiction medicine physician uh, in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. So I want to start off the, this meeting like I started off the last. I think it's always important for us to remember why we're here. Uh, we, have a, we have an incredible job a task in front of us, and, and, and sometimes I, I don't know about you guys, but I get to looking at charts and graphs and things like that, and I forget that there are faces behind them. So i uh, start off with a, with a couple of stories, if that's okay. One, one bad, one good. So this past week I was in East Tennessee. I work in a, a drug court up there, uh, Judge Dwayne Sloan's drug court in the Fourth Judicial District. We had a young lady that he sentenced to eight years in, in prison for various things, um, but she is actually going to come into our drug court. And in all honesty, in our drug court team meeting, um, I was pretty dejected because uh, some people in the room who were there to, you know, supposedly try to help folks with this with this issue that we're dealing with, were pretty hard on her, and they said some pretty uh, pretty some things that that made me uncomfortable. And and the PO sitting next to me was so uncomfortable that she she actually uh, cried. And I can promise you, she's uh, she's not the one to cry. She's she's pretty tough. But at any rate, we. Uh, we got her in court, and she opted into our drug court program, which we're really glad about. And the PO asked me if I would go back and talk to her after drug court was over with. And so this young lady had been on, has been on MAT. Uh, she's been on Suboxone, uh, four milligrams a day for about a decade. And in that time, she hadn't had drug screens that had anything uh, in them from an opioid standpoint. So from that standpoint, she was doing good. But she was still involved in all those other behaviors um, that, that was part of her addiction. And her big deal was she kept slipping with methamphetamine. 
and those of you familiar with meth in our state right now know there's no such thing as, as pure meth. It's uh, almost all or, or partially adulterated uh, with fentanyl. And so when I started getting back there and, and taking her history, she was a child model. She was a model when she was 19 years old and worked for several companies doing modeling, just a, a beautiful young lady, <clears throat> and had some things happen in her personal life and her family life and had a really long trauma history. But I asked her, I said, why do you keep having issues with methamphetamine? You, you know, your, your cravings are doing well on medication. And so, you know, tell me what's going on. She says, Dr. Lloyd, I just don't have any energy. She said, I can barely get out of bed. And she said, I swell up and, and, you know, I've had weight gain. I can't lose weight. And so I'm an internist. And I'm sitting there and I said, honey, has anything ever happened to your thyroid? Seven years ago, she had a complete thyroid ablation. So she had uh, a goiter. They took radiation. Uh, they gave their, a radioactive iodine to her. So they killed her thyroid gland. Guys, your thyroid gland controls about every function you got from your heart rate to your bowels to your bladder to your energy level, to the amount of fluids you hold on to. I mean, it's a big dog from a hormonal perspective. And I said, and then whenever they do that, then they come back and they give you the thyroid hormone. So they replace it, and you have to get your TSH and free T4 where it needs to be over a period of time. And I said, have you ever been on thyroid medication? And she said, no. And I looked at her hair, and she had great big chunks of her hair coming out and back. She had actually pulled her hair back around and pulled it in a ponytail. Uh, to cover up her alopecia from her extreme hypothyroidism. So my point for, for telling you all that is that we can sit there and we can look at her and we can say, okay, there are consequences for these things that you've done. But I don't know when the last time somebody sat down and took a medical history from her. We need to correct her thyroid gland. We need to give her a chance like we would anybody else from a medical standpoint. There's nobody in this room that would go seven years without thyroid medication if you had your thyroid completely ablated. So she's sitting in jail up there right now. Luckily, some friends of mine in Nashville are going to take her in an outpatient or an inpatient treatment program for as long as she needs to stay, and we're going to get her stable from a medical standpoint. I have no idea how she's going to do. I have no idea if she's going to be able to stop her methamphetamine use. Like, guys, I don't have a clue. I can't predict it. But I can tell you that basic medical care needs to be something that we provide for our patients instead of just writing off everything to her addiction because I promise you that's what's happened to this child for the last seven years. That's the downside. The upside is what you see on the screen up there. Sorry, we couldn't get a better picture. Uh, this is my friend and patient, uh, Nicole. Uh, Nicole has multiple felonies. Uh, she uh, was involved in an, in, a, in an auto accident that did damage years ago uh, to her brachial plexus. And she had pain issues and, and uh, actually shopped around pain doctors for a long time. She's of, of Cuban descent uh, from South Florida, but now lives uh, just north of uh, Nashville in Sumner County. And she had, year, several years back, she had got call, calling in prescriptions under her name from a, from a doctor. And so, by the way, she tells this story publicly, and I have her permission, so I'm not violating anything. But I want to show you some good things, too. So Nicole, is, uh, uh, Nicole goes through that process. She gets involved in drug court. And I hear people say all the time, you can't coerce people into treatment. I beg to differ. Because Nicole did not go into drug court uh, with a smile on her face. She went there as an opportunity to get some help, but it wasn't exactly uh, voluntary. But she did really, really, really well and has done well for a long time now. And uh, so she progressed through the drug court program. I got her as a patient about four years ago. Uh, Nicole was pregnant in um, early 2020. And uh, in March of 2020, she, had, she uh, sent me this picture from uh, the delivery suite at the hospital she was at in Sumner County. That's just one of her two twins. The other one's not in the picture. He's off somewhere else. But if you remember what happened in March 2020, all right, the world shut down, and Nicole needs to come to the doctor's office, but we relaxed telehealth around that time. So she didn't have to come into the office. We could actually see her, which I did there via a computer screen. And we took care of her without having to come in and subject herself and her newborns to other people who may or may not uh, be infected with COVID-19. And that is a success story from telehealth. There are some downsides to telehealth, which we'll talk about as well, and how it can be uh, bastardized, and it has been in, in a lot of ways. But Guys, I show you this to tell you that there's not an issue in here that we're going to look at that's black and white. There's going to be pluses and there's going to be minuses. Tommy and I talked this morning coming down the road, and he was coming from Chattanooga, and I was coming from Nashville, and 
and it, we're, we're talking about this abatement, the, 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 the remediation list. And if you look at this remediation list, the words OUD and MAT are used far more than any other. That's not to suggest that those are the only ways. MAT is a tool like anything else. We've got things like prevention abstinence-based treatment, which is an ungodly successful for a lot of people, particularly when we give them the things that they need in, their, in, in the support, like job training, education, right, transportation, all of these other things that we know are social determinants of health. And so it will be up to this council to decide, you know, we're going to be at the mercy of what's presented to us. But there's other things besides medication. And I talk about medication, and I'm going to talk about it at the next meeting because it is a tool and it's controversial. These other things aren't controversial. But as we go through this process, I want you all just to be aware that, that really this is a, it's a continuum. It's an entire ecosystem, and there's not one single answer. And there's not going to be anything that I know that we're going to talk about that has a yes and a no. There's always going to be pluses and minuses, and there's always going to be cases that we can point at that said this is causing a problem here. It's an unintended consequences, and we're going to have to try to figure our best how to work through it. And I struggle with that every day. There are days I go home, and you all know what I do, and I think, did I do anybody any good today? Or am I part of the problem? And I do that way more than anybody knows. When I do that, I try to go back to this. I try to go back to the people that I know we're helping, and that's what this council is going to do. So it's a little bit of a long-winded introduction, but I wanted to make sure that, you know, that, that I'm transparent with what, what I'm bringing here um, um, as your chair, because everything that we do on this council is sunshine. We don't restrict our meetings, and I encourage you, and I look around the room, and I see a lot of people that I know and love, and I'm glad you're here. And if there's people online that, that want to come to our meetings, please come to our meetings. We have a public comment section. We'll listen to what your input is. And, and, and members of the council, if there's people in your communities or people in your networks that have a question about what we're doing, uh, I'd ask that you invite them to our meetings. So since you just walked in, I'm going to uh, embarrass you. Oh, really? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me embarrass uh, Tarn first, and then we'll get to Stephanie. So uh, Tarn's late. I'd like to point that out uh, right off. It's raining. I got It's okay. It's okay. Uh, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Williams couldn't be here today, so Tarn, if you'll uh, introduce yourself. Okay. Good afternoon, Tara Sloss, CIS Commissioner for the Division of Substance Abuse Services, the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. And hi, friends. It's good to see a lot of you here. Thanks. We're glad you got here, Tara. <laughs> and when we're doing introductions, I forgot our, our team's person uh, on the screen. So, Dr. Vanterpool. Hey, everybody. Stephanie Vanterpool, University of Tennessee Medical Center, um, uh, pain medicine and anesthesiology. Good to be here. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Dr. Vanterpool. <laughs> Darn, I hate to do this to you, but we're uh, to your point uh, in the in our meeting agenda, just as an introduction and, and gratitude. So I just got finished with mine, so you're up. Okay. Oh, whatever you would like to say to our council, Maria oh. usually does. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's so awesome to be here. Um, I do apologize for my tardiness, but the weather kind of pushed me back a little bit. Um, just excited that we are here and we have an opportunity to do something that everyone is doing across this state, and that is addressing the opioid use disorders and the impact <clears throat> of those medications, especially the synthetic opioids is what we're seeing a lot of fentanyl and what it's doing and doing to the, the individuals in our state. So I'm just grateful that you guys are taking your time to share your expertise, but not only that, to also look for a solution that we can utilize in the state to move us forward. I will tell you that um, although our numbers increased by 26% this year, the overdose deaths, last time was more like 45%. So the work, we are doing some good work. It's that we just got a lot more work to do, and we're hoping that next year that we see those overdose deaths, those numbers actually decrease even more. So thank you guys for everything that you're doing. All right. Thank you, Torn, and I am, I am glad you got here safely. Um, I'm going to try to have uh, at least one stat for you at each meeting, and the stat I picked for this meeting is this. Illicit drugs are now the number one killer of Americans between ages 18 and 45, more than firearms, car accidents, and COVID-19. And it's a major contributing factor to the sharp decline in U.S. life expectancy. So on that note, uh, 
I think it that everyone has had a chance to review uh, the meetings from our, our, sorry, the minutes from our September meeting. Uh, does anybody have any additions, corrections, deletions, or, or otherwise that we need to address uh, before we uh, move for approval? Approval. All right. I've got a motion to approve. We'll have a second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries, and the minutes uh, uh, are approved as they stand. All right, council accomplishments. So uh, I was very, very happy at our, our last meeting with what we came out of there with. Uh, you know, my favorite part of any meeting, of course, is the adjournment. But uh, I thought we got some things done in the meantime that really moved us in the direction that we needed to be going. Uh, we approved the revised remediation list, and um, uh, uh, Mary has sent that out to everyone. I take it uh, we'll, we'll rest assured that you have it. If you don't, let us know. And, uh, and we'll be, uh, we, we can get that to you. That's to be used by the, com uh, by the counties and by community applicants. And remember, that remediation list did not come from this council. For those of you in the room that uh, want to know what we're talking about, it's part of the settlement. It uh, explicitly lays out what the money can be spent for. And it was part of the multi-state litigation. So when you signed on as a state, you agreed that you would abide by this list in the spending um, of those funds. Um, we learned about the system. We looked at uh, an overview of the treatment ecosystem. We laid that out for you. This is not a matter of, uh, you know, I've got hypertension, prescribing antihypertensive medication. This is a complete system. All the points of entry, uh, the, the health, social determinants of health fit in and what we're looking for as, as far as outcomes. And then we had uh, my former student, who I'm very proud of, Dr. Miranda Williams, uh, presented on overdose fatalities uh, in Knox County. And I think you guys saw the recurring theme that happened with that and the missed touch points that we had uh, before each of, those, uh, each of those deaths. And then last but not least, the application process work group. Uh, we identified four of our members of this, uh, of this council uh, that worked on our application uh, that they are going to, present, uh, going to present today. I actually got a sneak peek at it on Friday. And uh, uh, not to bias you, but I was, uh, I was uh, way more than impressed. Uh, they met twice to discuss the process, and they're going to present their recommendations uh, later on in this meeting. All right, moving on. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. I want to get one other thing I need to talk about. One of the things that, that, that I want to talk about before we move on is does the council wish to create an application or certification process? For counties applying for funds toward programs not on the count on the council's list of approved programs. Okay, so so the count the counties go by this, right? But as Tommy and I were talking this morning, there's some things out there that I think fit into this, but maybe aren't spelled out exactly in this. And one of the examples I think you brought up was uh, drug endangered children. And then some things around prevention that may not be explicitly <clears throat> spelled out in the remediation list. And so what I would like to know from the council is, would we like to create uh, an application or a certification process where we can at least consider those things uh, as a part of, of this remediation list? Maybe it's something we look at and we, uh, the applicant doesn't think it's in here, but we do, that, those are easy. But maybe it's tangentially or maybe it's a loose connection but it's something that, that the council feels like would be a worthwhile pursuit in the spending of these dollars. So that's, that's my question to you. I'm a yes. <clears throat> I would say yes, and I've already been uh, approached by one of our local, uh, the CASA, uh, that does interact with a lot of uh, families that are affected by um, uh, the problem we're approaching here. So I would say yes. We have the legal idea. Yeah. I think the, the moral and philosophic intent of everybody would be to do that on a case by case basis, so long as we have the latitude to do it under the under the statute. And that that would be my question as well. I think what we can do as a council today is uh, we can make our wishes known as a council, and then uh, uh, you know let the let our legal folks tell us whether or not we have that latitude. Opinion. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to carry this forward. I don't think we need to bring it as a motion right now. Let me carry it to legal and get an opinion and let them know what we're thinking about. Uh, you know, the Steve Lloyd part of this thinks that there's a lot of things out there that we can look at and make it fit in here. 
I mean, I really do. But I want to make sure that we're where we need to be on the legal standpoint. So if it's okay with the council, I don't hear any objections. And Mary and I will carry that forward. We'll get a legal opinion on it, and we'll bring it back before our next meeting. Uh, a couple of other administrative things uh, that I want to update you on. Uh, we had our sunset hearing at the end of November, uh, which is a lot of fun. I really appreciate that picture that you put up there of me. I don't know who that guy is with no hair. Uh, and it's a glare. That's why I wear a hat, by the way. Uh, but it went very well. I want to thank you to our council members uh, who attended, um, uh, Tommy, uh, Wayne, Armando, Lisa, Charm, um, uh, Ken, and Karen Charm. I don't think you were there, but you had a representative there. Uh, you had somebody with your office there. So we had eight members of our council there. There's only 15 of us, and uh, I can't tell you how much I love sitting there uh, with regards to that um, because I know how invested we are, are, are all in how invested we all are in this. Uh, the Government Ops Subcommittee approved two uh, more years for the Opioid Abatement Council. The reason that we didn't get three is because we haven't spent any money yet, and I think that's completely fair. I've been before that, uh, that uh, committee and subcommittee on numerous occasions and other roles I've had, and I think this is completely reasonable. We had a ton of support. I thought that it went um, uh, really, really well. I thought there were some interesting things that they brought up. Uh, one of the things was around MAT, and I, want, I just want you all to know that about length of it and, and, and what we're going to do around that. What I came back at them with, and my answer is, and then I think it's the right one, is the state has already established rules uh, for individual, uh, for clinics and prescribing guidelines for individual prescribers. And so that process is already in place. So I don't think we have to recreate it, but we can certainly talk about it with the applications we have coming through. And we're actually going to talk about length of treatment uh, and reimbursement for that uh, in this meeting um, later on. Uh, they said at the end of two years they'll call us back, they'll want to hear our progress, and I'm sure they'll want to look and uh, see how we're spending our money. So does anybody have any, any questions about that? Okay. And any time I go before them, there's always stuff that comes up that catches me off guard, and there wasn't, uh, wasn't any doubt that happened again this time. I'm not going to comment on it. I would just encourage you to watch the video. All right. Um, the draft vision for the work of our council is, is still uh, uh, on our agenda. So do we need to do anything from around that or just to adopt that as our vision? I mean, right. If there are no edits, then, yes, it can be adopted as the, as the vision. So I'll, I'll read it to you if that's okay. That's, uh, our draft vision says to approve and allocate the dollars to the opioid trust fund so that Tennesseans struggling with opioid addiction <laughs> find relief and pathways of recovery to being hope and restoration through effective and transparent work of all Tennesseans which will, be, which will bring prevention and support for those families impacted by the opioid use disorder. So, that's okay. I would certainly, certainly I'd entertain like to, a motion. I'm sorry. I'd actually like to modify. To I'd like to modify. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. I'd like to include a modification. I think it's very important that we include the patients with chronic pain who are potentially in at a gateway um, uh opportunity for um, op to be to go down the path of opioid addiction if their pain is not treated properly. I really think it is a miss on the council if we do not include some language speaking towards um, chronic pain also. Um, whether it is struggling with uh, chronic pain and opioid addiction to find relief pathways to recovery, um, something along those lines. I think excluding them would be, um, would potentially narrow our scope in a way that could be detrimental down the line. Thanks, Dr. Vanderpool. Um, and I agree. I, you know, I think in, 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 in this work, sometimes the, the pendulum swings too far. And we have a, a, a big significant group of patients out there with chronic pain who have had their access to life-changing medications changed as a result of actions taken by others. Um, Dr. Vanderpool, do you have any idea about the wording of that, or would, would you want to look at this uh, offline and bring it back? There's no hurry. I think opioid addiction and um, with or without chronic pain um, or, or potentially chronic pain with or without opioid addiction. Um, the challenge is we are, we're really focused as Opioid Abatement Council on minimizing opioid misuse, abuse, addiction, um, and so on. But if we don't get to the crux of what gets so many patients into it in the first place, you mentioned one of your opening stories, uh, one of your your patients had a brachial plexus injury and then, you know, became uh, dependent on opioids and then had other issues following that. 
um, we have to make sure that we address that. So um, is I don't know how the council feels about putting opioid addiction and or chronic pain because the rest of it applies to both. Dr. Vanderpool, what I have here is um, opioid trust fund so that Tennesseans struggling with opioid addiction with or without chronic pain find relief and pathways of recovery. Is that acceptable? I think that's acceptable because we have treatment options for patients with chronic pain also, but we want to make sure, like you mentioned, that just like with your patient with a thyroid disorder, that we treat the underlying conditions. It's important not to ignore it. I like that. I don't know what the other council members think. So let me let me read it to you as it would exist now to approve and allocate the dollars to the opioid trust fund so the Tennessee and struggling with opioid addiction with or without chronic pain find relief and pathways of recovery to bring hope and restoration through effective and transparent work for all Tennesseans which will bring prevention and support for those uh, families impacted by opioid use disorder. Is there any discussion around that? I think it's worded right. Opioid addiction needs to come first. That's the purpose of the council. Um, I think Stephanie's right. We need to consider chronic pain with or without. It puts it in there. It, it sends a signal to people that we're not going to forget people that that have chronic pain. Um, where it is, relief and pathways recovery could, a, could apply to addiction or to chronic pain. So I think where it is and, and which phrase you put first is, is good. I agree. Do have a motion to adopt this as the uh, vision for the work of our council? I'll make a motion. I have a motion of Armando. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. All right, Mary. I think that brings us to administrative updates from you. And <coughs> Texted me, and she is going to be a team. Okay, that will work. And I want to update you on our missing colleague. Uh, just to, to Brian's left, uh, uh, Sheriff Casey Cox. Uh, he he has uh, got some issues with his gallbladder, and uh, so hopefully he'll be uh, uh, a quick road uh, to recovery. So we miss uh, miss Casey, and I think he's uh, uh, either joining us or, or we'll watch later. I think he had some um, uh, medical stuff to take care of today, and that's why he's not with us. I'm sorry I neglected to tell you at the start. All right. Um, so you have your binders in front of you. I do have a staff member that's starting today, so she's going to help me get those organized. Um, and as soon as the staff members are on board, I'll introduce those uh, to you. But the staff member that's starting today, and she's a new employee orientation. Her name is Ella, and she's going to be helping out a lot of the administrative work that, um, that I'm doing around travel claims, um, different statements that y'all are having to sign, and, and such like that. So I'm really excited to have to, to get her on board. So real briefly, the travel claims, can I use yours as an example? <laughs> um, if you could fill out the city that you left and the Say that you arrived, Jackson, put the dates and the times, fill out this information down here, and please make sure to sign it. That's all you need to fill out on the travel claim, and then I'll complete rest of it. And then if you stayed in a hotel, if you could email me a copy, thank you, email me a copy of your hotel receipt. And then I will get those processed um, this week. Any questions about the travel claims? All right, conflict, conflict of interest statements. I received some back, and I know that there are some questions, and I was going to um, open up for discussion real quickly on that. But before, I wanted to read um, a little bit of an interpretation from the Department of Mental Health uh, Legal Counsel around this that hopefully may answer some questions. So I'm going to start in the middle of, a, of an email. If the council is voting on providing funding to a certain organization where that person is employed or has other significant interests, then when the vote regarding that decision comes up, the person would abstain from voting. So to answer the person's question directly, no, an agency that someone either works for or is affiliated with would not be ineligible for funding. Um, the proper mechanism would be for the person's recusal um, as outlined in the procedure. So I know there are a few questions. 
So wanted to open it up for any other questions or any other discussion on the conflict of interest form. I'd gotten calls from several of you around this and before you signed it, you wanted us to look at it and, and that's what we've done. And so what, what, you know, what we found out is what Mary just related to you. So we will make sure that there's no other questions around that. Mr. Chairman, I, I had a question about the form because um, typically in COI forms that I'm accustomed to signing for CME or other uh, activities, we're supposed to list and volunteer uh, activities which we feel would be in conflict. For instance, if I'm giving a, a CME talk on depression and I have significant stock investment in a company that makes an antidepressant product, I would need to declare that proactively. Um, and that's listed, or if I'm a consultant for a particular pharmaceutical company, <coughs> that's listed ahead of time on my presentation. There was no such um, opportunity on the CI form. I recognize, though, for some of you, if you listed every potential conflict of interest, like for you, it would be 64 pages long. Right. So I, I, that was one question I had about it. It looks like with this legal opinion, we have a means to, 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 to deal with that. I do think that I'd like to see us be internally a little bit more robust. The legal opinion is that we would recuse ourselves from voting. But let's just say his cousin runs a CBD clinic and they're going to apply for funding to give somebody something. Tommy talks about it for 45 minutes and at the last minute says, well, I, I'm going to abstain from voting. I think up front, if any of us have a W-2-1099 familiar domestic partnership relationship with anybody that comes before us, we ought to declare that before discussion starts. So I'd say, well, I'm Clay. My cousin runs this halfway house, and, and uh, I'm, I'll be happy to discuss it with you, but I want you all to know that before the discussion so you can weigh my comments as the discussion is ongoing. Rather than have it swaying a bunch of people's opinions, <clears throat> per, perhaps, right. positively or negatively, and then at the end saying, hey, I'm going to recuse myself because that's my cousin or my ex-wife or whatnot. So I, 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 I don't know exactly how to operationalize that. I just think internally it'd be very good if it's if it's family, uh, 1099 or W-2 relationship. I think the council needs to know that when an application comes forward. Any thoughts about that? I I love that. I agree uh, completely. I think there may be a maybe we can at each. Um, when we discuss each project that comes up, maybe the very first item on discussion is, are there any conflict of interest to be declared before we discuss the projects? I like that, that way yeah. it's that yeah. it's it's operationalized in the agenda. We don't have to remember. It's like actually part of the process is step one, declare COI, step two, discuss project. Thanks, Dr. Benson. Yeah, I, I think it would be great if, if uh, Mary could have a list like of our W-2 and ten nine nine conflicts ahead of time. So if we just write or email her our W-2 our conflicts so she knows ahead of time. And then, with, like you said, we before we start, say your conflict of interest before we get talking about it. I think, I think this is a really good step towards transparency that we need. Um, and I was going to ask you all this, you know, before the end of the meeting, and now is as good a time as any. Uh, we're going to talk about the process that our subcommittee has put together. And then out of that will come how we uh, go about, you know, if it's approved, how we'll go about scoring these applications and the groups that will do that. Uh, if it's okay with the council, I would like to keep myself out, out of all those groups. I've got a lot of other stuff that I do, and I would simply like to take the recommendation that comes from the scoring because if I do, if I do what Clay just said, it's going to stretch from Johnson County to Shelby County. And, and, and that's fine. That's the reason that, that I'm here. And I'm, I'm good with that. Um, I trust the work of this council. This council is way more than me for sure. So uh, I would ask that leeway as your chair, but, but uh, you know, I'll be glad to list my conflicts as well, W-2s and, 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 and family as well. But I would like to stay off of all of those and simply take the recommendations to the council and present them that way. So is the recommendation to revise the conflict of interest or leave the conflict of interest statement like it is and then have folks declare and maybe I'll keep a list. So, where, where is it in our packet? Mary, uh, we can read it again. Unfortunately, I forgot to make a copy of it. Okay. Um, I read it last night. I would leave it like it is personally yeah. and then just add what we just said. Add 1099 W-2s in your complex to Mary. 
Yeah, I would I would think that you know the 1099s and the W2s to marry, and then it just becomes just like Dr. Vanderpool says, it comes just a part of what we do when we go in to discuss an application coming before us. Uh, you know, I know we do it on medical board all the time. It's before we get into any case, we stop and we say, is there anybody here that has any conflict of interest with this? And I think it just becomes a regular part of how we look at each application. Yeah, I do. Okay, and, and our legal counsel's on the um, call right now and listening into the conversation. So I'll circle back with him when I get back to the office and we'll um, we'll put this into process. Okay. And I don't think we need a, a motion or anything okay. for that. So I, I like I just like the extra layer of accountability and, and transparency. I don't know if any of you all saw the article. I think it was in um, USA Today or one of the one of the big website news websites. But Ohio is having all kinds of problems with their council like us. And they're having all kinds of problem with it because people don't feel like it's transparent and the public doesn't have an opportunity to give any input and and the members of the committee have not been very transparent themselves voluntarily so uh i'm very grateful for what we have just so we don't have to go through something like that all right go ahead yep. okay all right um fiscal update so at each meeting i'm going to share the current monthly opioid abatement trust fund statement um and so the information that y'all are gonna get is current to the date that I receive a statement. So I'm gonna receive monthly statements from FNA, Finance and Administration, and I'll get those around the 10th or so of the month for the previous month. And then um, at our meeting, I will share the most current version or the most current statement. So I wanted to share this slide again with you guys. This was at our last meeting, just because there's gonna be a little bit different um, in the numbers, but that's because I'm sharing what's exactly was in the trust fund at the time that I received the statement. So y'all remember this from the last meeting. And then this is the statement that I received um, for the month of October 31. So the net available is uh, $43,852,556.46. So I know there has been deposits post 1031, so actual, the actual money in the trust fund is much more than this, but I've got to have some way to keep an eye on the money, and that will be the, the monthly statements. Okay, any questions about the statements, the balance in the trust fund? And I think that's the number we used in front of the... Um, yes in front of the subcommittee of our government office the other day. Yeah. The only expenditures so far have been um, travel for the uh, committee members, the lunches, and then my salary. That has been the, the only expenses so far. All right. That ends my part. We're ready for the subcommittee. All right. And those slides are not in the packet. So yeah, only right but yeah, the slides of our of our uh, subcommittee are not in the, the packet. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I thought we had Kurt was going to talk about. Oh, that's um, after the break. Oh, that's after the break. It's, okay. We're happy to move it around. Do you want no, to no, 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 no. Okay. It's fine. It's All just right. on the back of that sheet, and I was getting nervous. I was missing something. All right. So we'll move on to the work uh, of our subcommittee, and I, I'd like to. Uh, I met with the subcommittee on Friday, and um, it, it consists of uh, of Clay, Karen, um, Stephanie. Uh, and, and Shane, um, they presented this to me on Friday, so I'd, I'd ask the group, if you, if you don't mind, let's let them get through the entire presentation of what, they do, of what they've done, and then we'll go back and, and take a look at individual components of it and questions that, that we'll have. But I wanted them to be able to present it in its entirety and then, and then us look at it from, from there, if that's okay. All right, Dr. Vanderpool, I will uh, let you take over. All right, thanks, guys. Um, well, uh, the council met, um, uh, the subcommittee met twice over the course since our last meeting to this one to come up with um, processes and um, guidelines to allow us to create a transparent but effective uh, application process that is in line with the remediation um, uh, suggestions. And what we're going to do is we're each going to take a little bit of time and present the slides that we uh, primarily worked on, and then we'll open up for questions after. So I'm going to turn it over to Shane. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, what you the slide that you're seeing looks pretty pretty obvious, uh, except it will not be over time uh, if we don't 
go back to what the, Steve was saying, sometimes we can lose our mission between meetings. So we, we're asking we're asking this council to adopt a policy that we create a book such as this that goes that, that sets out our uh, the mission as we just adopted and goes through as it contain the, the statutes, uh, all the things that we're agreeing on, and we stay familiar with that. We stay maintaining that information. Uh, that's within the council, outside the council, and I've noticed that going through this uh, this document. Uh, come up with, with an application that thoroughly explains purposes of the funds and the role of the OAC in selecting those grantees. Uh, again, it may seem obvious, but it's the type of thing that we will forget about, and we can complicate our job if we don't stay on top of that. Uh, with the framework, the application will be less, less than complicated and applicant friendly, so the responses are more discernible. I bring very little to the subcommittee other than having done this. I've been on a, a foundation that was very similar to this, much smaller, but the same mission. And uh, us meeting, and that's another decision we have to make later, how many times we're going to meet. But between meetings, uh, we need to make this job as easy as it can possibly be for the council members and also as communicative as it can be to those grantees. We're still in the process of drafting that document, but these are just guidelines that we wanted to talk to you all about. That, that it, they're not very precise at this point, but we hope that we can get your cooperation and your agreement that those are important uh, concepts. Brevity should be a major objective within and without and outside the, AO, the OAC. Uh, again, these are just the ideas that we're trying to put together. Now, you're going to hear much of the work that, that goes toward that in just a moment, but I think that probably explains that slide as well as I can explain it. <coughs> Doctor? Are we ready for the next slide? Yes. Yes. So we um, discussed at our last meeting the approved opioid abatement strategies, and that was the remediation list that we voted on with the addition of adding the latest best practices. Many of you are aware that the CDC came out with their updated 2022 opioid prescribing guidelines. And we wanted to make sure that those were included um, and referenced appropriately. And also because we have um, an excellent chronic pain guidelines here in the state of Tennessee, we wanted to make sure that um, uh, recommendations from those ten chronic pain guidelines are the updated versions of those chronic pain guidelines would also be applicable to the abatement strategies. Uh, next slide. Karen. Okay, this was my job. <laughs> so, um, as you all know, that document, Appendix C, is pretty detailed. Um, we have the overall strategies, and then we have the supplement that gets into the more details. So my job in this subcommittee was to basically go through each one of those strategies and assign them to a bucket. So uh, you'll see the buckets there. We've got primary prevention, harm reduction, treatment, recovery support, um, education and training, there was a lot of information in those strategies around educating either healthcare providers, the criminal justice system, um, and so I felt like that really needed to be broken out as often as that was mentioned in there. And then we've got the research and evaluation of our, our practices and how well we function as a group. But then once we grant out these dollars, we need to have an overall strategy on how we're going to evaluate the effectiveness of our grantors. So um, we figured we would need research and evaluation partners um, in order to do that as we go forward. So, um, and then we looked at the allocation, just trying to come up with, of the whole, what percentage do we believe should go in each bucket? And of course, you'll see treatment has the highest percentage because when you look at the, the continuation um, of services under substance use, treatment is by far the most expensive piece um, that we do on the continuum. So you'll see that 40% um, is allocated to treatment strategies. And again, you have all of these letters and numbers and that Basically, you can pull out Appendix E and you can look up, okay, what B2 is um, and why I put that under the prevention strategy. 
So again, um, this was just a way to try to organize a lot of information um, in a concise way and have as a reference point a way for the council to go back and to look at that particular strategy. As we start granting these dollars out, we will ask our, our people who are proposing, you know, which, which strategy is your particular proposal addressing? So um, I felt like this was, we felt like this was the easiest way in which to do that. Thank you, Doctor. Thanks, Karen. Um, Clay. So once the applications come to us, um, Karen's part was about, you know, how we think the buckets of, of dollars are going to be spent. To some degree, we're at the mercy of what we receive, but that's our idea of how we should um, allocate the dollars provided we get quality applications across the board. Once we get an application, how do we decide what's a good application and not in terms of how it meets the mission of what we want to do uh, for and through Tennesseans? And so we kind of came up with seven categories that we thought were ways to grade these applications. Uh, and we weighted them according to how we thought they should be weighted. These numbers are obviously negotiable, but here are the seven categories that we found. Number one is the impact. How many persons are going to be impacted? Uh, how they're going to be impacted for how long? What changes do you expect to see in those populations? And what metrics are you going to use to track those? How will inequities in care be remediated? Um, and we felt like this was an important uh, part of impact and should be called out specifically in terms of uh, remediating inequities in care. Um, the irony of the opioid crisis, as many of you know, is that persons of color were initially insulated from some of the prescription opioid crisis because of the prejudice of the healthcare system. Black people didn't get as much Percocet when they went to the ER for a broken arm uh, or carpal tunnel. Uh, now, they, uh, sometimes the persons of color are having difficulty getting on MAT and staying on MAT and having access to care. So uh, doubly damned in some ways uh, because of, of, of prejudice. I think those inequities need to be dealt with. Number two is innovation. Uh, what new approaches to existing challenges are proposed in the program? Is there a plan to share learnings of these innovations with the medical and larger communities uh, that form the network of care? Uh, around the, the counties. Well, what's the integration piece? How does the proposed program fit within the existing ecology of prevention and care? Are there plans to incorporate collaboration with other community resources? Uh, sharp minds around the room will realize that number two and number three are somewhat in conflict. If you're very innovative, you may not be able to integrate very well and vice versa. So um, that, that's just the nature of the beast. Evidence base, um, and again, this is one that conflicts with innovation. Is there an existing evidence that supports a proposed approach? Um, if there's not, is there good reason logically to believe it will succeed, and why or why not? Number five uh, plays into that feasibility. How practical is the proposal? Are the business business and management plan solid? Maybe a great idea, but you know, you, you got to have a way to fly the plane. Does the entity have the staff and infrastructure? Required. If you're going to affect everybody in your county and you've got two staff members, we have some questions. Um, sustainability. How will the proposed initiative extend beyond the funding period? We don't want to fund for 180 days and have everything fold on day 181. What percentage of the budget will be carried by the abatement funding? Are we putting wind behind existing sales of a ship or is somebody trying to build a ship based on abatement funding alone? Number seven, credibility. What's the track record of the principals in the healthcare space? Do they have uh, past successes that we can look to that would uh, predict future results? And how strong is their commitment to the community? Is this three people who fly in from Michigan one weekend a month to run a pain clinic uh, out of a strip mall, or is this somebody who has roots in our community? It makes a difference, I believe, in terms of how we would view that application. So these are the various uh, percentages that we thought, and basically these add up to 100 and an application gets a 100 score or less, depending on, you know, if you got eight points out of 10 on innovation, but four points out of 10 on integration, and you got 12 out of possible 20 points, you can see how that goes. And that way, if, if Wayne's looking at an application and their Mondo are, and they're on different subcommittees, but you come up with a 60 and you come up with a, a 40, we have an idea that you looked at a better application. Your 61 may be not different than his 60, but obviously if we have a wide gap, 
kind of gives us a way to compare across because what we envision is enough good quality applications between meetings as Shane was saying, we're going to need multiple subcommittees evaluating these applications so that when we come to the meetings, we have a pretty good idea out of the subcommittee. You know, if we've got a 98 application, probably ought to approve that. If there's a 37 application, that's probably not worth the full committee's time. So that's our idea of this rubric and how we might use those applications. Stephanie. Thanks, Clay. Um, let's go on to the next slide, please, Mary. Oh, and um, if you can turn off your camera, if you're not part of the council, uh, we'd appreciate it uh, just to help us get more screen space on the monitor. I think I see. All right, and Thank next you, slide. Oh, yeah. If you're not if you're not a member of the council, if you could turn off your camera. Thank you. All right, Shane, I believe this is you again. Yes, again, this might go without saying, except it gets lost in the message over time. Uh, we, we, we decided that scheduling was a very important part of this, and, and within that, the, the amount of time that we have the opportunity <coughs> to view the applications. Uh, the hypothetical is just something that kind of puts, puts points on it. For instance, if the application deadline were February 28th, we would have we propose an initial vetting process where the staff would take a look at the applications. If they don't meet certain criteria, they're automatically removed. If they get through the initial vetting, we just do the 30 days up there. It goes to the subcommittee, as Clay was talking about. We would, we've got a lot of expertise in the room in a lot of areas. Within those areas, we would we propose that we create subcommittees <clears throat> up of different walks of life that have a first shot at the vetted grants, grant, uh, grant applications. That would be a 30-day process in the hypothetical. Uh, once those get through, we come back to the full, full uh, the OAC decision, that's the group meeting. And on those numbers, we're talking about a five-month cycle, five and a half months. It sounds like a long time, but we need to be kind to ourselves and kind to the grantees and, and giving them the, the right opportunity to uh, uh, to, to, propose, to make proposals. We also talked about, and Stephen brought this up, that we need to give feedback to the applications that don't make it, just so we can be transparent and explain to them, here's how it missed the mark, maybe do better next time. But uh, those, all of those areas give us a chance to review uh, in, a, in a reasonable amount of time what people are needing. The next in the box, mm -hmm. the OAC grant meeting schedule semi-annually. We talked about that we meet semi-annually, we meet quarterly. Uh, we're going to leave that up to you all. I mean, we, we have ideas. That's what the box is about. The more time between meetings, the more applications we will have to review. Uh, and that's, that's a thought. But uh, we want to make sure that we give the whole process here is enough time for us and the grant, grantees, potential grantees, to have a fair hearing. Thank you, Doc. Thanks. And um, last slide, please, Mary. All right. And um, if we wouldn't mind having uh, uh, other non-council members, if you turn our cameras off for us, please, that would be great. It helps everybody be able to see the screen better. Um, so this is our final slide from the subcommittee. Um, so what we're summarizing is essentially we need to be able to present to our potential grantees a notice of funding opportunity. As a, as a major consideration, though, we want to make sure that there's a fair playing field for those with large budgets versus small budgets. So your community church that wants to operate a halfway house may not have a multi-million dollar um, budget of a research institution at their disposal. So it would not be fair to compare their proposal to a, um, a, a significantly high, more highly funded organization. So we're proposing that there'd be two categories of um, applications where we can compare side to side. One would be small cap, which is budgets under 1 million versus large cap, which is annual budgets 1 million and over to equalize that playing field. On the right, you'll see a table, which is a proposed funding opportunity um, tables. This is modeled off of a SAMHSA um, funding opportunity application where we have the funding opportunity number. This would be determined quarterly or semi-annually, depending on how the um, council decides it wants to proceed. Again, based on um, what uh, Judge Sexton mentioned, um, the frequency of applications and the number of applications we plan to review. 
Um, the total available for funding will be de de determined by the committee. Do we want to allocate the entire $43,000 in the first funding cycle? I would say probably not. I'm oh, sorry, $43 million in the first funding cycle. I'd say probably not. We want to figure out what percentage of that uh, would be available for funding in each cycle and also the number of awards. Again, separating that out by large versus small cap, et cetera. The funding categories you see are the ones that um, Karen mentioned, the six funding categories. Ideally, the applications would come in and identify which funding category they are primarily associated with. I know there are some groups that might have multiple funding categories um, uh, in their proposal, in which case, do we want them to submit multiple applications or not? That is a, a question for the council. Um, the estimated amount award, um, whether or not we require cost sharing. I wanted to highlight these proposed dates because based on what Shane mentioned earlier in terms of a potential timeline, if we were to open up applications with a 228-23 deadline for submission, that would make our anticipated award date 615 of 23. So we need to make sure that the community and as a council, if we're okay with this, we'd know that we would not be allocating any funds until the middle of next year, which on the one hand sounds like a very distant time frame and a long time to hold on to these funds. But on the other hand, as we've mentioned, in terms of our need for transparency and accountability, we want to make sure that the funds we are allocating have a good chance of making the impact that we want them to make. Um, and the rest of the table is pretty self-explanatory. The last one I want to highlight, though, is the eligible applicants. We um, recommend it to be eligible applicants, which are domestic, public, or private entities. Um, uh, as Clay mentioned, we want to make sure that they are reputable entities, um, nonprofit or not-for-profit. Um, I think it would be determined by um, whether they're valid entities and um, appropriately motivated entities, and we would be able to see that through the application process. And with that, uh, that is the presentation of our subcommittee. We thank you for your attention, and we'll welcome any questions. I'll turn it over to um, Steve. Thanks, Stephanie. So other than that, they didn't do anything. Uh, uh, you know, just to, uh, I mean, I, I don't have the words to thank you guys. That's a tremendous amount of work. And Karen, I'm sorry that you got tasked with what you got tasked with. That's, uh, I would have, I would have not made, yeah, I, I would have pulled my hair out uh, over that one. But at any rate, yes, yes. Um, so I think, I think, you know, when I follow, when I look at this, for me, it flows really, really well. So uh, we'll open it up for questions and comments and, and uh, you know, start the process of, of seeing how we go about uh, making this happen. I got a couple of questions, a couple of comments. Uh, whenever you look at the rubric for application evaluation, uh, is that something that's available to the applicants so that they'll kind of understand how to be scored to make sure yes, they understand? Yes. Uh, the next thing was uh, trying to decide how much of the $43 million we should allocate. And I think if we could uh, create some type of uh, spreadsheet that kind of shows us what the projections are over the next four to five years, that would uh, give me some ideas on how to let that money flow out. Uh, and then lastly, as far as um, if somebody fits into multiple categories, uh, that seems like it'd be a, a lot of work to create separate applications for each category. Uh, I think the merit of some of the applications may be that some of them cover a lot of bases as far as uh, areas that they're going to cover. So I, I think we would cover it all under one application. I think the, uh, the, the KISS principle here is keep it simple. Shane, he's, he keeps reminding us that we want to make this straightforward and streamlined. Uh, and I think those are good talking points, you know. You don't want to say easy on ourselves, but it, straightforward and streamlined makes sense. If we make people make six applications for the same entity and they're doing the same thing, that's just creating six times the work mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, not that, I mean, we all have day jobs, but the, the, the real deal is if we're spending six times the work on that application, somebody in Blount County is not getting their application the right consideration because we wasted, you know, 5x of our work. So I think our subcommittee felt that a single application could be acceptable. Um, but yes, we want to be very transparent with the rubric. Uh, we want to be very transparent with what the rubric represents. Because frankly, we want the applications to mirror the rubric. And when we see it line up, then, you know, if, if that's what you guys think, 
if that resonates with you as being the purpose of the of the, the committee work and where we want the dollars to go and have an impact, then the more the applications line up with it, then all we got to do is make sure they did what they said they did. So I I I, I hate it when granting uh, entities make it a mystery what they're looking for, where it's got to be a, literally a treasure hunt. I think that's asinine. So the, the more transparent we can be with what we're looking for, so that our Tennesseans of good faith can understand that. That's a win for everybody. It's dollars in the right hands so that the right impact can happen sooner rather than later. Agreed. Um, Mary, do you mind going back to the rubric slide, please? I think it's, and I was also, also going to say about the spreadsheet for projections, we can definitely do that. But also remember, 35% uh, of the dollar amount that I showed will be going to the counties. So it's actually, it'll be less. 30, 35% less of the balance statement that I showed. So, um, thank you, Mary. What's about 30 million. Um, I, I, so, go ahead. No, 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 go, go ahead, Dr. Pankful. I, I wanted to highlight, based on what Clay was saying, when we looked at this uh, rubric that Clay um, uh, put together for us and drafted and we agreed on as a subcommittee, if you look at the way the questions are wording, that essentially is the application. That's how we view it um, as one way. If the council agrees to adopt and accept this, this can be easily turned into a granting application. Um, uh, this can These questions can easily be turned into the actual application, which would make it easier and more streamlined for us to be able to value, um, evaluate each of the applications. Another thing to note is um, if you uh, look at the different funding categories, we would just need to figure out as a council how we would want any multi-category um, applicants to des designate which categories their funds are going to. Because remember, we're overall as a council, we're looking at percentages of funds to different treatment buckets or to different buckets. So you want to make sure that if somebody's coming in and, and applying for something that crosses multiple buckets, um, can you go to the previous slide for me, please, Mary? If you're applying to something that's covering both primary prevention, treatment, harm reduction, what does their budget kind of align with these allocation percentages? And if not, how do we fit it into the overall allocation percentages we have for the um, for the abatement funds? So I just wanted to highlight that that that's one thing we'll have to consider as a council. And when we're requesting applicate um, grantees to submit their uh, their budgets or their proposed budgets, they'll also need to have this information too to see how things. <laughs> Fit in if that makes sense to everyone. I think we can ask them to do that work for us, Stephanie. If somebody's asking, somebody's yeah. asking for a hundred thousand dollars, just make it easy. And they say we're doing treatment and we're also doing recovery support because we're going to follow people over time. Just making this up. Well, mm -hmm. as a council, we've said okay, forty twenty in terms of outlay of dollars. We could ask them to say okay, if you're doing treatment and recovery and you're asking for a hundred thousand. How much of that are you going to spend on a treatment? How much are you going to spend on, on recovery support? That way it makes it easy for us to kind of back calculate. So, okay, how much did we throw toward each bucket? And again, those numbers are, uh, we propose these numbers. Uh, you know, we're not under a legal obligation to stick, you know, if it's 39.1 and 41.2, that doesn't matter. But, you know, just we can ask them to tell us which percentage of their budget applies to which category if they're a multi-category grant T. Right. And to be clear, it's not that their it's not that their project can only have forty percent of their dollars go to treatment. If they're a fully right. if they're a hundred percent treatment project, then a hundred percent of their dollars can go to treatment. But what yeah. we need to make sure is that in the total amount that we allocate from our fund that we're responsible for allocating that we preserve some money for the other buckets in the ratios that we as a council have determined are valuable so that we don't overfund some initiatives and underfund others. Yeah. Okay, right. Just the thought of, uh, well, actually a note of appreciation for the work of the committee that put this together. It's awesome. Uh, you know, and in the spirit of simplicity, to uh, another thought is if your primary proposal is treatment, then those dollars would be allocated or or uh, attributed, pulled out of the treatment dollars. Uh, and 
and if the primary scope of service was related to prevention, I think it would, as opposed to trying to dissect each proposal budget and determine for the for the applicant to try to do that, and then for us on the tail end to do that might be difficult. I don't know. It's just it's just a thought. Uh, and it seems like this is a fluid, or not necessarily fluid, but a a guideline for us in terms of of our uh, uh, how we manage these dollars and allocate these dollars, and that that would give us the flexibility we need on our end. Uh, if not fluid, at least malleable. You know. It could be certainly, certainly yeah. it could, it could, uh, target may move over time. We may right. find that their money is not being sought in one bucket that we might have to adjust. Yeah. That'd be my question. There is, is moving the allocations. Uh, how do we go about that? When are we going to be looking at moving those allocations or the percentages in those? We didn't talk about that directly, but I think we handed around. If it's not, if money is not going out of a particular bucket, then we need to think about reallocating those funds and spread them across the board. I think we'll learn that. We just don't we just don't know, you know. Uh, I, and Tommy, I think that that's a topic that we have later in the meeting as well because there's several things we need to look at around that. And Ken, I love the fact you brought up about about the money, the 43 million, all right, and, and what we have coming in so we can kind of look and see, you know, what we have coming in and, and can allocate it appropriately. And so, to me, that needs to be a running spreadsheet, right? I mean, because my anticipation is is that there'll be dollars added to what we have right now in addition to what we already know is there because we know that there's already been three other settlements that Tennessee's been a part of. And so I'm not sure what that looks like going forward. My anticipation is at some point it'll come through here. And, and then I want to know how much we have and then how much is coming in and then look at what our spend rate is. And that's where I'm really hoping for some help from, you know, the department because you all have a ton of experience with that. So looking at this, I mean, what are your thoughts on it? As it relates to where the, where the buckets are? Where, where the buckets, the process in general, I mean, the state allocates money like this all the time to multiple programs across, you know, across our state. So, you know, from your experience, does this look reasonable? Well, I guess my, my my question is, are you going to buy any medication? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because if you're going to buy some medication, mm -hmm. it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. So that's going to make your treatment bucket bigger than probably what you currently have it at. Mm -hmm. but, but I really don't and think I, Can I just say yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. So our substance abuse block grant is a little bit more than what you guys are looking at allocating. We get about $32 million a year. Uh, about 70% of that is spent in treatment. So just kind of give you an idea. Sure. About seventy percent goes to treatment. How much I is think, spent in evaluating whether the treatment's effective? Totally different. So I'm just talking about just providing services. Services. About seventy percent of that money goes into treatment. I get that, but it appears to me that the evaluation thing has to be in every one of these. Oh, I agree 100 percent, and that's out, that, that would be separate. Yeah. So generally, when we do evaluation of a grant, you know, we probably spend it, it, it depends upon the size of the grant. It depends upon what, what, what we're being asked to uh, provide, you know, back to the funder. What it is. So we spend, I'm saying, you know, I saw a grant, we're probably spending about $400,000 in evaluation. Yep, and that's a $60 million grant. And so you said I have the a question. That's okay. I apologize. When you finish. I was going to say, so you're, you're saying that, that medication and treatment um, really consumes a large, vast amount of the funding. Yes. So that's that's one of the things I'll have, I'll have to look at as far as readjusting. Right, right. Because medication is, is it, now, and it also depends on what type of medication, too. So, you know, all of that kind of runs the gamut of what, what you're looking at funding. Your your um, your injectable naltrexone is going to be your most expensive, along with your methadone, you know, your buprenorphine, suboxone. It runs the gamut if you're doing pills, if you're doing injectable. So, it, you know, but that is, it, 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 it's a lot. It costs a lot. Then when you're looking at if you're doing the ASAM, and if, and if, which is what we we require our providers, you have to follow the ASAM criteria, looking at assessment and those levels of care. Residential, 
we all know that all of that has increased, um, you know, because you're looking at providing care for a person 24-7, so your staffing is different. You know, outpatient, it looks totally different. When you talk about residential services, that's why I say we spend about 70% of our block grant goes into treatment. So thank you for that, um, Deputy Commissioner, because I think that's an important point. Two things to that that come to mind. The first is that it highlights that there already is additional funding for treatment. So we need to make sure that we acknowledge that the opioid abatement funds we recognize the need for treatment, and that's why we've included it as a major bucket in our uh, in in the in the allocation. And it may be that those numbers definitely need to change. But the purpose of the opioid abatement, according to our vision, is not solely treatment, but to really provide a route, hope, um, recovery, and all of these things, prevention, all of these things that are necessary to help the state of Tennessee. And navigate this crisis in a way that we can get out of it. So I think it's important for us to look at um, all of the other things that the current grants currently do not provide coverage for and make sure that we're appropriately funding those. The second question I had for you, um, Deputy Commissioner, because uh, you have experience with this granting is, do you receive applications that maybe cover more than one arena or maybe have multiple programs within them? And then do you kind of is it a yes or no to the whole application if like 60% of it you're like, yeah, that makes sense and there's a 40% that doesn't? Or or is do you fund that 60% and then tell them to come back with the 40% reworked? Because I think that's something we as a council may potentially run into, especially as we consider maybe having one application that might be multifaceted, people with multiple buckets that are applying for multiple buckets. Do we want to approve or decline in block or do we want to, we've got to be careful not to create more work, but you know, we don't want to negate a, a very good component of application because you know, 20% of that application might not fit the rubric. I don't have the answer. I'm just questioning the council as to what your thoughts might be. Uh, I can't okay. answer. <laughs> so, um, okay, so you got different, different types of grants. The grant that I just spoke of was a block grant, which is totally different. Basically, they say, here, this is what we want you guys to do. They tell us what they want us to do with the funding. They actually tell us pretty much how much what they want to see that break to be, that 70, 30. They pretty much tell us that. They want us to spend at least 70%, around 70%. Prevention, we put a little bit more prevention because we have learned over the years that if we can prevent, maybe we don't have to treat as much in the long run. So we have increased the amount that we put into prevention, but we have to spend at least 30% of our funds in prevention. It's just a requirement. Now, that being said, moving the block grant to the side, let's look at it as a regular discretionary grant, you know, where we have actually made application for and was awarded. So we pretty much, we build a budget, and we tell them, they say, okay, Here's an amount you can apply up to this amount, and we'll say we want to apply always the maximum. So we're going to apply for the maximum amount. So that's six million. So say the six million dollars. So we build a budget around what the six million dollars look like based upon the criteria that's set out in the grant, because they will tell you what type of activities they want you to provide. You get a list of them. You can choose. You got some that are required, and then you got some that are not required that you can do if you want to. So you go through and you pick through, pick it, look at all the requirements, and then you build your budget around. And then if there are some additional activities you want to perform, then you build a budget around that. So um, I guess kind of looking at what you're talking about, like multiple things at one time. So that's us at the state applying for a discretionary grant. Okay, we received a grant. So now we're going to put the grant out into the community. So, so here we go. We may or may not do an RFP. It depends. We have our um, network of, of providers we've worked with multiple years, so we are very familiar about what they can do, what they can't do, um, where we need to grow. So we kind of we just kind of have a sense of what our system looks like on the indigent side. And I'm speaking only of the indigent side, so we kind we kind of know what that looks like. So then we will work with our providers to say, hey, this is the project that we're doing. 
this is what we would like that you to partner with us to do, and we will help build a budget. We will work along with them in building that budget. So it's totally different than what you guys are doing because what you're doing is actually soliciting, and you're putting the RFP out, which we've done that before. You get the you, so you have the rubric. Everybody, uh, you ask them to build a budget because basically, after the last RFP we did, we just said, "Hey, here's the rubric. You you tell us what you want to do." You tell us, and then we will, based upon our rubric, we will score it to see if you adequately answered the question. These are two different things. Cause I'm, all different I'm, things. I wasn't yeah, good at it, but I know what you did. And, and so <laughs> I wasn't good at it at all. But it, it is different. I think, different. I think Wayne's question is a, is a really, really good one because I've harped about this uh, the entire time I've been involved in addiction medicine. Outcome is the only thing that matters. I mean, that's what matters. And as I look at this rubric, you know, where's the question that we're going to ask them how they're doing? It, 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 does it does it need to be in there? Is it in there and I don't see it? One. Okay, it's in one. Is that, okay. So they should tell I got you, you that. No, no, when, I they, when they write the application, they should right. give you that. They should tell you how, right. what they're going to do and how they're going to do it, and right. also how many people they're going to serve, if it's a number serve kind of thing. That's what they, they tell you. Because we, that's what we do with the feds. We tell them right. this is the number of people that we plan to serve, right. plan to serve. I, Clay, I knew it was in there somewhere. I just couldn't find it. So so that that's the key. And I, and I think that's, I mean, we, we have to look at that. You know, I, I try, whenever we're talking amongst each other and putting this stuff together, you know, presented here, I keep going back to the to the three words that A.G. Slatery gave us, all right? And, 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 and the last one was accountability. We want to know what we're doing is working. If we get, you know, two years deep into something through before we re-up it, we want to see some, you know, what kind of impact are we having? And and so it, it's in the rubric. And so I, I, I think it needs to be a point of emphasis because, I, you know, just because you checked all the boxes, if your outcomes stink, then we need to be looking in another direction. Well, Could I, I'm sorry, go ahead. We could we could easily move that to 30% and make sustainability and credibility 10% each. I mean, these numbers are, are are malleable again to use that as if so so we could do that uh, and and that's the rubric model if I could beg pardon for just one moment and go back to Tommy's question of of allocation uh, my suggestion would be semi annually or annually per application cycle the way Shane sets this up I think it makes sense I think we want applications every quarter because it just you know, we don't work twice a year. We work all the time, and if we if we if we make once a year application, we're going to be buried for the next 45 days. So I, I think quarterly applications make more sense, and it's more opportunity, frankly, for people. They don't have to wait if they've got a good project. They can get it together. If they miss a deadline, it's just another 90 days, and they get the deadline again. So waiting a whole year or a half year. But if we wait semi-annual or annually, an application cycle, we can see what comes in, and if every good application we got is on treatment then we could move some of those dollars around yeah. at the next time. So the, the, the allocation is our internal guide. There's no external pressure for that. We could change that theoretically semi-annually or annual with, with, with uh, the application cycle. And, and if you want more on one and, and everybody agrees, that's fine. This is a starting point, not a finish line. Uh, we had some debate about this, and that's how we wound up with it. But we wanted more comment and and buy in or buy out from you from from you guys Armando I'm sorry no you're fine thank you uh, thank you so much for all the work that this committee has done on on that I think it, I think your rubric is great and it yeah. gives some great guidance but I want to have one question it's, it says a due date for applications of February the 28th of 2023 are you going to actually establish an opening date for when applications can begin and then the other question that I have is it maybe something that we may look at is do we want to look at possibly having a, a like a program grant coordinator uh, if you, while well, my working with the Tennessee Highway Safety Office, they have program grant coordinators that actually take and work and manage the grants that review uh, the things that are going on and the processes that are occurring throughout the, the timeline that the, that the agencies are getting the grants. They're doing uh, on-site monitoring visits, uh, and they're, they're actually also used as a, a network to take and to assist people in applying for the grants. So whenever you take and apply for an opioid uh, uh, treatment grant, that you actually can go online and you have a built system online to where they're actually, you answer these specific questions, produce and provide these specific documents, and do all these certain things, and then they're actually reviewed by a program grant coordinator, someone that can actually know the, 
the way the operation was to work inside and out. So that's one thing I've been working on with the Department of Substance <coughs> Abuse Services, and I was going to talk a little bit about the proposed due date right here. So I'm looking at electronic system, and the state of Tennessee does have a system that we could possibly use. However, it wouldn't be available to us till probably around July to, to accept applications. It's already built, but there's going to need to be some customization. <coughs> so I am looking at electronic um, process for this. As far as another position, um, the state law allows for me to hire two people. Um, and then if the council feels as though that I need more staff, then that's something that y'all can present um, to the Department of Mental Health and I, maybe to um, FNA as well to hire, to allow for more positions. But um, the program manager that um, I'm planning to hire will help out with this process as well. Okay, so you have one already. That's you already got that. Yeah, so I'm getting a project administrator, and that's who's starting today. And she's helping, going to help out more with the money part, the fiscal part, the administrative part, and the program manager, who it will probably be another month before she can start, will be helping more with the um, applications. But it's, you know, it's hard to say at this point what the workload is going to be. And that's something that I'll definitely continue to report. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll definitely report back to you guys um, what the workload is looking like. Lisa has her hand virtually raised there. Hey, Lisa. <laughs> uh, Lisa's on mute. We got we to unmute you, Lisa, or you need to unmute you. Okay, unmute yourself. If she's on her phone, she'll press star six. Star six. Oh, where did she go? Well, she did like me and tried to unmute herself. She probably hung up. <laughs> there she is. Oh, um, Jessica's helping her. Okay. We'll, we'll move on until we, we get Lisa here uh, in a second. Uh, Ken? Uh, I'd like to go back to some of your comments, and I think I made those comments in our initial meeting, is that we need to be, be able to make sure we're measuring. And I'm still a little bit confused how we're going to have that metric. For example, a new applicant, a new entity that applies, they have no track record. So how do we then verify that when their grant runs out, how they've done? Uh, and also, I think that uh, having attended the Sunshine Committee, you know, they're going to be looking at us and saying, well, how are you accountable? How did you use this money and how many lives did you say? How many I have, you know, what, what can we show? How do we measure those things that we're going to tell the Sunshine Committee next time we meet? So I, I'm, it's still all around the metrics, and I'm sure maybe the Deputy Commissioner may have some ideas as far as metrics we might use. When, when I'm looking at that and looking at the way this is laid out, they're, they're going to have to tell us up front in that very first uh, column in the rubric and um, in, in the impact, uh, you know, what are you going to track? What are you using to tell us how this is going? And, and and so I don't think that, as opposed to what Tarn said, I don't think we're telling them. I think they're telling us. And if you look at a two- or three-year grant cycle, then I think we figure out what we want those increments to be, that they, that, that they have to report to us how this is going. You know, and, and I'm just thinking about in my world. So in my world, the most important thing is retention and treatment. So if I tell you that, that one of my main metric outcomes is retention and treatment, <laughs> So every six months or whatever this committee decides what the reporting is going to be, I need to tell you how many of these patients that we've treated are we retaining in ongoing treatment. That's a big deal. And so I think, unless I'm misunderstanding it, they're going to tell us what they're going to measure. We're going to, go, we're going to be okay with that. If we're not, they're not going to get the grant, or we're going to give them feedback and say we want to measure in something else, right? Yes. yes. And, then, and then we decide when we want them reporting back to us because we've got two years. And so as I think about this, and I'm getting input from a lot of places right now from people that I've known and trust for a long time, it looks like a two- or three-year cycle, and then it looks like uh, incremental updates on how you're doing on those things you're telling us that you're going to measure. Yes. Is, that, is that reasonable? For okay. most of the grants I have, you know, we're very heavily grant-funded. It's quarterly reports. Mm -hmm. Some of mine are semi-annual, <coughs> but most are quarterly. Okay. Yep. Lisa, we're not ignoring you. When we can figure out how to get you unmuted, you can just speak anytime and interrupt. Oh, it looks like she's unmuted. I, I think I'm unmuted. Can you? You hear are. Me? You are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 
Thank you. Um, one thing, and I may be missing it on the rubric, but I feel like it would be helpful if the council could see how the proposed project fits in with other state funded programming, like Taryn was talking about the block grant, the SOAR grant, some of the other provincial programs. I feel like um, there is so there are so many really good initiatives across different departments of the state. It would be helpful if the council knew how each of the applications are fitting into, for example, some of the work with Department of Health, with TANF money, um, human services, different things like that. And then that way, like Mary and her staff can create an overview of how the funding that will flow through this council is really helping to advance different agendas across the state of Tennessee. And how then, when we do look at evaluations and outcomes, we can look at how it's moving system involved families in some of the big areas of focus of the state to a better place and just how effective we're being as a council across the board. I don't know how well it's showing up on your screen, Lisa, but that's that's number three in its entirety. Uh, Ten percent of our rubric is dedicated to that. Uh, the title, the, the heading is integration. How does the proposed program fit within the existing ecology of prevention and care? Are there plans to incorporate collaboration with other community resources? So exactly to your point, that is um, a, a substantial portion of our evaluation as to how this will fit in with existing uh, treatments. Um, if we're making well, more if, wheels, that's fine. Reinventing the wheels, not good. No. Right. And if I, if I could clarify just a little bit more, um, I feel like when you look at prevention and some of those kind of things that may or may not be taking into initiatives in the department of corrections in criminal justice, it may or may not be taking into effect initiatives in Department of Children's Services, because when we look at the effects of the opioid epidemic across our society as a whole, I feel like the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse is, is fabulous and doing a great job with this, but where Families Free has contracts and funding with different departments of the state, I think just to make sure we're looking across all sectors of society and different departments as to how these initiatives are impacting other systems as well. We, we thought of prevention as being it hasn't happened yet and care as being it has happened, but we may need to alter our terminology. We thought that was all inclusive, but we may, there are, I, really, I recognize there are technical terms in, in different care silos that I, uh, some of us on the subcommittee Chief of myself may not be aware of. We thought prevention and care had it covered, but if it doesn't and we need other words in there, we, what we mean on number three is if it exists, how are you going to integrate with it? Lisa, do you have any do you have any proposed wording changes there that would address what Clay just said? I can send those to you. Okay. And I have another comment real quick, and that is um, when it comes to when it comes to integrating with existing projects, um, what what do we want to put in place so that applicants know what existing projects are out there? I'm not talking about new projects that are being applied for. I'm talking about existing projects within the community. Is it something where we expect them to list in their application? How does in number three, how does integrate in fit in the existing ecology of prevention and care within your current community to show an awareness? Because to Clay's point, if it's a fly by night person coming in from, you know, six states away to just run a clinic on the weekends, they may not be aware of what is currently going on in the community. So how would we want to, how would we as a, a committee want to make sure that that is at least addressed? Because, you know, is everything, is everything that's for treatment and prevention public and publicly available or public knowledge in some way? What do we need to, how do we, how do we allow our grantees to be prepared to fill out that section number three accurately? Does anybody have any comments on that? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit. First of all, I don't think there's ever a way to know 100% of everything that's out there. I mean, I think there's always going to be limitations on that, but 
But the other thing, I mean, if you're actively involved in this in this field in any of the areas that we've talked about, uh, you should be aware of, of of this stuff. I mean, it's it's part of the lifeblood for, for what you do every day. And so hopefully, we'll be able to you know to to vet that out during the during the grading process. You know, if you're coming to us with this proposal that, that we look at and go, well, this is already being funded by three or four other sources, I mean, we're going to know that. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll have a, a mixture of folks on, 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 the, uh, on the review subcommittees that will be aware of those. So I think some of it will happen that way. The other way I don't have any clue about because there's a lot of things out there. There's so many different funding sources. There's so much money available. You know, Lisa and them in, in, in East Tennessee have got a – a new treatment center getting ready to open that's funded by a totally separate pot of a pot of money that that you know other people in this room may not be aware of. So, I, and it's going to be a great thing. But I'm not sure how to how to do what 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 you what you just said. I don't know if anybody else in the room has any ideas around that. Well, one you know one way as 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 we look at proposals would be uh, it, it wouldn't be inappropriate to ask for. Memorandums of understanding from an organization that is 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 saying they work with other they're integrated. So, you know, if if, if there's a proposal related to reentry uh, and a provider is saying they're working with the jail, then the jail would have an MOU that would be a part of that proposal, or the or an emergency department or a school or. Uh, if, if we wanted to require something like that, uh. you know, is is that part of this process as you envision it? I mean, I love what Brian said, so I was thinking about a jail program. So you you have this proposal that comes forth for a jail program, or maybe an ED program, where you're partnering with community <laughs> providers, or a, or a or a tertiary referral center. Do you want something in support of this application from those, like a letter that we would normally do in a grant? Or, or uh, you know, a memorandum of understanding—is that what we're thinking about? And do we spell that out? I think that has to do with feasibility, right? I mean, if you're saying we're going to work with this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, if you look at the application, there's no proof or substantiation of that whatsoever. Then, you know, where's the credibility piece? I mean, when we were doing a, a, a program uh, information form, uh, they call it a PIF in academia. I had to have letters from the dean. I had to have you know, any hospital that we were training in. I had to have a letter showing from the CEO or the CMO that they were going to allow our residents to go in and train there and all. You know, you had to have all that together to show yes, we support this project. And you know, if Clay says he can do this, yes, we're behind him a hundred percent. And so you have all these glowing letters of recommendation. But if you don't have enough sense to put those in the application, you know, I, and we can we can put this in the rubric. You know, it would be expected. If you propose to work with an existing entity, you know, it would be helpful to see letters of support, memoranda of understanding. We can give people hints and clues. That's what we're looking for. But I think that's a that's a parcel of, of you know, grant writing as a whole. So especially in and of itself, God bless the people that are good at it. But, I mean, we can show people what we're looking for, but somebody that knows what they're doing and knows how to take care of these folks. I, th I think that's going to be pretty obvious that they need to provide us the information. If we think we got a great candidate with a great idea, and they have a great heart, and they have a, a a really subpar application, I think that's where we go back. And I, that's why I love the 90 days. This is a great idea, but you said you're going to work with the jail. We hadn't heard from law enforcement on this. Can you come back and give us some reinsurance? Reassurance, and they only missed it by 90 days. Yeah. And so back to Brian's point too. Um, if it's going to be a collaborative partnership and you're going to share resources in a grant, it should be an MOU that specifically lays out each person's role in that collaborative partnership, and that should be signed by the head of each entity. Yeah. Um, so that way, on the front end, you've done enough planning to know who's going to do what and who's going to be accountable for which pieces. And so, again, I think those MOUs are going to be extremely important for anything that's going to be collaborative. I may, may be out of line here, but I, I want to come out at the end of our day today when we leave here, have an application we can put forward. I mean, that's what I want coming out of the day. I have a timeline of, of how we're going to get started. And so I think with that in mind and what Clay just said, I think that's, I think that's great. I mean, 
if you have experience and you are, are, are doing this, to, you know, to any degree, you should know these things already. And if you come to us with this, then we have the opportunity to give you feedback to do exactly what you just said. And it's only 90 days. And so I like that. I, I like that much better than, than tabling this and bringing it back with, you know, for it to be, you know, ultra inclusive and spell out exactly what you needed every step of the way. I just think, you know, I, I think that makes it complicated, at least from our standpoint. It's just my feeling on it. My um, thought on this process would be to take this rubric and put it into an actual just a Word document application until we're able to find the electronic application process um, that we would um, typically use, whatever application system Mary and her team decides we're going to use electronically. But to take this rubric, put it into a Word document, and um, put some addenda or some kind of footnotes about necessary things to be included, such as your budget and your MOUs and things like that, and then have the council electronically via email um, agree that that's exactly what we want to send out and go from there. Um, I don't know. I know, Steve, we don't want to delay it, and I'm not saying that this would be a delay, but this the questions are there, but I think when you see it in format in terms of an actual Word document with the, you know, make sure you've included these five attachments, uh, that can be done over email, but I think then everybody, then there's you know full transparency as long as we all, as a council, agree with the general structure, i.e., do we agree with the categories, the seven categories, and do we agree with these percentages? And again, remember, as a council, we can vote to change the percentages down the road if we find that these weights don't don't quite jive with what we want it to be. But um, in the interest of both transparency and expediency. Um, I think converting this slide into a Word document with the three to five additional attachments noted at the bottom that are required and having that be available for the granting for the granting applicants um, to start preparing um, is going to be important. The other thing we need to talk about, y'all, is word limit. You can ask Shane. We don't want to be reading 1,800 pages of a grant application, so I just want to put that out there. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Stephanie. Uh, Mary and I were having a little bit of uh, an anxiety attack, but but we got it straightened out um, because we're talking about because that's my questions. Uh, does anybody else have anything else? Well, I just think that it would be really good to to be to be transparent as far as what is needed, especially like when it comes to MOUs. Mm -hmm. I have a lady that uh, you, I connected you with that's a prime example that has zero experience working with grants, but yet. She had been so effective in already acquiring property, already establishing a type of uh, really well, uh, uh, I guess you would say, treatment program. She's laid so many things out. She's in the process of getting her certification for certain things because of our guidance, and she is very driven. So you're going to have people that will need that clarification. Uh, you know, whereas other agencies, they're going to be right on it. they got grant writers all the time. And so uh, that's that's just my input. I was actually thinking about her when Clay said that because that's somebody with a with a great heart, with a great idea that needs some guidance, and and so that's that's the perfect one, Armando. In, in looking at this, Stephanie, what we were thinking about is this was going to be our application process, but it's not. So you're talking about taking this, putting it in a Word document with those added things, or a little bit of guidance, you know, expecting supported documentation, letters of. of uh, letters of support and memorandums of understanding, whatever it is, and then take this, translate it into that, get it out to our group with a period of time to comment, uh, recommend changes, uh, or accept as is, knowing that at any time we can revisit these. Because yes. the percentages, I mean, frankly, it looks like as good a starting place as any to me. Yes. And, and, you know, it may be 5%, 10% here that we have to, you know, do down the road or some of the categories that Karen worked so hard on. But I think it's a reasonable starting point. And then as long as this committee is willing to, you know, to be flexible going forward, realizing that we can change this based on what we see, the quality of applications we see, how much allocation we have, just what Tarn said, sometimes medication is more, um, uh, you know, then we can make changes going forward. So I think that, I think that this still fits, Stephanie. And one of the nice things, Armando, about the small cap and, and large cap division is, is you're creating – you know, it's like there's NAIA sports and, and NCAA sports. Yeah. I mean, you compete at different levels. <laughs> and, uh, you know, whether we call it grant coordinator or 
the person that's helping you vet these applications. I mean, honestly, my bias is going to be toward the person with a good heart that has to have multi-million dollar grants. I, I'm assuming UT will be here next year. I hope they are. Uh, and, and I don't think that our funds are going to make a difference whether, you know, Josh Heifel is a football coach next year and whether we treat people with MAT. I, I, I think that, you know, Ken Care is going to be here next year with, with due respect to what they do. I don't think they're dependent on our dollars. So my bias is toward a small cap. That's where my heart is. But I think as we work through these applications, what I'm hoping is we'll get a diversity of people who are probes at this that have been doing it a long time and, and, and are publishing on this nationally and internationally. And, of course, give them some money. They have a proven track record. But I'm hoping we get some mom and pops and churches and synagogues and temples and, you know, VFWs, whatever, that on the small cap side that your office can help <coughs> these guys to say, yes, it looks like you've got a good project, but here's what you need to make this grant go through the committee. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you need to be around for understanding because you say you're working with the jail and we hadn't heard from the jail yet. We need to, we need to make sure that's okay. And then you say you're going to report to this, you know, <laughs> Sure enough, at day 180, we're going to expect that, or we're not going to cut that next check for you. Because what I'm hoping is we won't get if, – if there's a quarter-million-dollar grant, we don't give them that money on day three, that that's divided up according to maybe a semi-annual reporting or whatnot. And then in order to get your next check, you have to turn in your metrics. That's what I would say. I agree. Hey, can I just add a comment? I mean, we're, we're diving in my way, the way I see this. We're diving in, we're diving out of – we already have established grant management systems, programs. Mental health and substance abuse does this every day. We have Office of Criminal Justice programs. We have federal grants and state grants, and many of the folks that are going to be applying for these are very, very familiar with, with the grant program, established grant programs. And then the criteria within those grants, what, what we're going to do, we have the flexibility or the ability to change those so long as it's within the guidelines. So I guess, I guess I would throw it out there and say, let's take a look at one of the established programs that we've got out here. Let's look at the state's guidelines on grants, your submissions, your programmatic requirements, your measurements, because your measurements are going to be incredibly important. You may call this, uh, you may say potatoes, and they say potatoes. So we've dealt with those, haven't we, Darn? Mm -hmm. Many times. And so if, if we clear that one up off the front, and then we can lay the foundation, and then we'll be able to change it to what we want to do in terms of the matrix or the ruby. I'm saying looking at uh, the Department of Mental Health's grant program or Office of Criminal Justice program <coughs> and look at their grants established. They're already granting agencies for many of these services now. What does that mean practically, Tom? Does that mean... Taking a do this or, or no, no, what, it, what? you continue doing what we're doing here, but let's grab her grant program. They already have the, the system, it's online. There's a reporting mechanism, there's an application mechanism, there's an application. There are all of those things that are already very well established right now in the state. We would not have to reinvent the wheel. And then we take that and see what, yeah, we add, we add hours to it and say, okay, how can we, you know, because us. It's incredibly important changing the language, and I've heard already just with us talking about some of the language used, that is so important. Uh, how you spell it, what you say, or how you record it is really causes a lot of consternation and a lot of problems. So if we establish that up front, then we can add whatever we want to. Um, and we're definitely going to adopt some of what the department <coughs> has as far as around the budget contract management system. Mm -hmm. But I'll definitely work with Taryn and see what we can do to, to you know, build upon the systems that exist. Yeah, because, and I'll tell you also going into it, things the way conventional criminal justice programs and what law enforcement tracks and collects, arrest data, this type of information, and then the other side of it, I mean, even some of the programs that we have within ours, uh, it's apples and oranges, and we got to make sure that we – we convert our apples to oranges to what mental health and substance abuse record or what they look at or what they call a particular thing and what we would call a particular thing. Um, and then just making sure that we, we plug those into the appropriate place. So what, what does it look like from right now? 
I mean, to me, what I see is we have a, we have a great starting point. Um, we'll talk about this. We'll take a vote on it here in, in a little bit if that's okay. And then what you say, figure out what the state is already doing and a way to plug this into that, which I, which I do like, because I don't understand. I mean, 90% of that, Tommy, in all honesty, I just don't. And, and I think if I don't, there's probably some other people in the room that, that don't either. So from what I see in, in, in just my overall assessment of it is I, I love the rubric. I love the things that we're asking our applicants to do. I love the fact that we can take this and put it into an application and send it out to our folks as this is what we're going to start with. So, you know, that's, that's my feeling on it. Steve, can we go back and look from, from number one, from slide number one, and just graze through it and see if there's any pop-up questions? Yeah. You mentioned the, the, the handbook. Much of that appears to be in here, but I, I can't can't say enough. We need to keep something, our little Bible, for lack of a better word, that, that reminds all of us the foundations of what we're doing. And uh, and I guess we need some process or some mechanism to create that. Is that? We can do that. I can do that okay. in the office. All right. Ready for the next slide? Mm -hmm. So do we want to just go through and vote on each of these slides as a council? Because it was a multifaceted proposal, would that make sense instead of voting on it one by one so we know that everybody's had a chance to comment on the individual components of this process as proposed by the subcommittee? Um, or is there another way we'd like to do that? So in my mind, I thought we would go through and, and vote on each of the categories within the rubric. Okay. Well, I'll let you lead. The, I'll let you lead the vote, and we can just comment. What about the funding bucket? Same for that. Uh, yeah, the funding bucket as well. As well. Uh, it looks to me like from the funding bucket, um, instead of going through individually, is is taking it as a whole, and then if that doesn't pass, then we can go back and look at the individual categories. Okay. That that would that would be my approach, and but uh, but I'm obviously willing to change that at the, at the will of the, of the council. Mr. Chairman, I, I move that we uh, adapt uh, the proposed funding allocations as listed by Member Pershing. We've got a motion to uh, to adapt the proposed funding bucket as, uh, as, as presented. Do I have a second? Okay. Any discussion? I guess an only a question that may arise, and the subcommittee may have uh, talked this through, in terms of a a amount per application in each one of these categories so if i'm applying for treatment dollars can i apply for the entire 40 percent of treatment dollars or or is there a two million dollar cap a limit to what my grant budget can be based on and then I guess the other part as we look at smaller organizations and larger organizations is there any value in defining that if if we are going to say you can't apply for the entire amount you can only apply for you know this much per grantee do we do we define it to the point to where smaller organizations and larger organizations so we have that listed. We, I think the answers to those questions are actually on the last slide of this presentation. Both the number of awards, the amount of the award, and the large cap versus small cap are all on this last slide, which we'll be getting to to vote for. Um, okay. Does that, does that address the concerns that you have? It does, yes, yeah. Okay. I think the only thing I would ask about this, as I thought about it a little bit more, is to make sure that we're not um, restricting ourselves to exactly those percentages. Uh, I think I would feel more comfortable if it said allocation percentage guidelines, something of that nature, so that all of a sudden somebody doesn't come back and try to save. It. So would you would you be more comfortable with uh, uh, funding bucket guidelines? Yeah, that, 
Allocation percentage, right there. <coughs> allocation right. percentage guideline yeah. would be fine too. Yeah. Estimates. I would recommend. Okay. Yeah, because you're locking it in at 15. Are you making a friendly amendment? As we say, making a friendly amendment. <laughs> That's what it sounded like to me, Plan. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll accept your friendly amendment to my motion. And uh, I can't remember who seconded it. <laughs> Brian, did you second that? Uh, no. who, who did? Yeah. Kim did, did you second it, Kim? Oh, absolutely. All right, all right. So <laughs> you, you, you're making an amendment to your second. Yeah. Okay, all right, I'm good with that. <laughs> any, any further discussion? And, and again, remember, this is a starting point. We get into this, we have experience, and we need to make uh, make changes. We, we certainly have the latitude to do that. So any further discussion? All right, all in favor? All right. All right. Opposed? We got one opposed. Um, uh, the motion carries. I'm curious as to what your uh, eye is for on the on the opposed step. No, no, no. I was uh, I was uh, in favor. It was a lag. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not mad. It's just tardy. I'm sorry. All right. All right. So can we look at the can we look at the rubric? So I would I would ask that that we look at the rubric the rubric uh, individually each of the seven components and address them one by one with uh, with appropriate motion. Again, with the same, you know, the same, uh, uh, I guess, the same disclaimer that we can look at this going forward with experience and uh, and make changes as, as the council sees fit. So, with regards to rubric number one, impact. Steve, may I make a suggestion? If um... yeah. Could we potentially vote on the categories first and then vote on the percentages second? Do you think that that would move it along um, and still allow for discussion? Because I'm concerned if we start going into nitpicking the categories and nitpicking the percentages, first of all, the math might not math properly and we might end up with 110%. So we just want to be mindful of those things. Does anybody on the council oppose us taking that approach? Is, is there a motion in there somewhere, uh, Stephanie? Yes, I move that um, that we accept the uh, proposed rubric categories and descriptions as written um, for the purpose of the application. So I've got a motion on the floor to accept the proposed rubric uh, categories as presented. Second. Second from uh, Ken. All right, any discussion? I do, I do have a question. Do we want to make part of that rubric also the submission of a of them having submitting an actual budget, clearly defining what they're going to use these funds for and what each categories? So One I think that would looking. that's a good point. Um, I'll I'm going to comment, and I'd like to hear Clay's comment too because he came up with the rubric. But I think that um, the categories themselves. I think need to be um, assessed and presented. I'm sorry, there's some echo here. Somebody's off of me. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Sir. I think the, the, categories, the categories themselves are one thing, and then the supplemental materials for the actual application, I believe, are what we're going to be coming back to the full committee with on the Word yes. document, if that's okay. Is that is that accurate? Stephanie, that's the way I see it. Uh, uh, and I'm wondering, I think you have an excellent point. Take a look at the second question under feasibility number five. Are the business and management plans solid? That doesn't go in the application. That's for us to think about. I mean, it, 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 the application will look like how will the funds be allocated and how, what is your proposed budget? You know, and, you know, please submit an exhibit that shows your proposed budget. So we'll take these questions. Come back. If, if you vote on these categories, you approve them. We'll come back to the Word document. It has this in applicant friendly language. But the, so there's usually attachments that are required in each grant application, your agency budget, the budget for the what you're proposing, your nine ninety, your latest financial um, audited financial statement. So there's those things that would be a supplement to the actual right, the rubric there that would be required. This this is a score sheet for us. We want it to mirror the application very closely, the keep it simple shame principle, but it, it will change the language around a little bit to reflect, yes, get, show us your budget. That's, that's what that second question will look like on the application. So as, as you're considering a vote up or down on this, what you're voting for is these categories and this general, um, uh, 
way of framing it. We'll come back to you, and you'll have an opportunity. I'm, I'm assuming, it is. Steve, that you'll have an opportunity to, re to accept or reject the final application between now and our next meeting. Right. I think so. And, and uh, Tarn, if you would, I'd, I'd like to, for you to share with the group what you shared with me with regards to the budget. Armando, I think she answered the question very well, so if you don't mind. So generally, your budget is not scored. Because when you really think about it, you're going to score the things that you're asking them. The meat of it is, you know, how you your project. Tell us how you're going to fund you. You know, how you're going to do the project. All that stuff right there is really what you are interested in saying. Your budget. They don't answer this right. It don't matter what the budget says. Because you're going to either fund them or you're not. You can always work with somebody on their budget. Because you're going to probably have some questions about it anyway. So because sometimes people get a little bit over aggressive in it and you sitting there thinking like, you know where you can maybe do this. But I like what you're saying here and I see what see what you're talking about. You can always work on the budget. But typically you don't score a budget. Okay. It's required. But you don't score it. You ask them because you want to see what they're the, how they're gonna spend the money, but you can always work with a person on that. Yeah, thank you. I just I, cause I just I think in general the more transparent we are, the safer it's gonna be for all of us. Right, right. All right, any, any further discussion? All right, so we've got a motion to second, um, and no further discussion. We'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, motion carries. Now, uh, as to the percentages. I'd like to make a motion that we use the percentages as outlined on the rubric as a guideline. All right, we've got a motion uh, that we use the percentages as outlined on the rubric as a guideline. The same disclaimer that I gave you before uh, before we took the last motion. A second. Eric, got a second. Um, any discussion? I have some discussion. I think unlike right. the unlike the allocation percentages, we have to be very careful when we say we're using the rubric percentages as a guideline because that can potentially unintentionally introduce bias. If we like some, if we say, oh, we like this project but they're not that strong on impact, but they're really good on innovation. We're going to tweak up innovation to 15% instead of 5%. That's unfair to the other applicants that brought in their outlines. Um, I think it may be best for us to apply the application rubric percentages per granting cycle yes. and make it publicly available per granting cycle. Now, if after yes. the first granting cycle, we decide that these percentages actually don't quite match what our intended outcome was, we can adjust it for the next granting cycle, but all grant applications uh, accepted under one granting cycle are approved or evaluated under the same percentage rubrics. Please. This is yet another reason to do it every 90 days, because if we, this sounds great today, <laughs> yeah. it should. I invented it. I love it. But if we don't like it, in 90 days, we can change it. Right. And Ken can say, that stinks, Clay. That's the dumbest <laughs> idea you've ever had, and you've had some dumb ones. But we can change it in 90 days. Right. But I, I think to Stephanie's point, for equity purposes, yeah. you know, for every granting cycle that's the same, everybody ought to be playing in the same rule. Yeah. Th and then thanks, we just change the rules next yeah. time. Thanks for that, Stephanie, because I was assuming that's what he meant. Uh, this wasn't spelled out like that, so that I get in trouble like that. So is that an acceptable amendment, uh, Ken? Absolutely. And, I mean, all right. Any further discussion? I, I guess the only thought I have is, you know, it does seem advantageous to take the state uh, – framework and and apply the pieces of this that that makes sense into that and then add to the to the the evaluation structure that that we're going to be looking at if, if I understood the one of the steps in the process because it, it, I do think there are a lot of things we could adapt Unless I'm wrong, I don't think that I don't think this motion prevents us from doing that. No, right. Okay, and that's what I understood from Tommy. So uh, I think that would be the plan going forward. Any further discussion? All right, all in favor? Uh, all right. Anyone opposed? All right, the motion carries. So we've got percentages and buckets, and we've got a rubric with percentages there. And uh, I have one final question before we take a break because I'm about to die. Uh, uh, how are we going to make people aware of this? I know that may seem like a dumb question, but, you know, we're in this room and it's online, but 
how do we get this information to the to the people who are interested in this? Well, again, I think who we're trying to re I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just saying back to Tommy's point. The state already has a process to release our FIs, and so um, it's just getting the word out to the public who aren't used to doing business with the state where they're going to be released. Um, maybe do a press release. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So, could, Tom, can you shrink that in real quick, so just so we're aware? Because I, I get really in trouble when I start making assumptions. I swear. So, what <laughs> so, does that look so like? So, generally, when we do RFP, um, we uh, we do a press release <clears throat> to let people know that it's there, um, hoping that. And, and I'm sure, I'm sure the media is going to pick it up because this is a hot topic. Yeah. So they they will put it out there. Uh, we'll post it online. And just, yeah, we can put it on our website. As well. So and they'll direct everybody to whatever the website is, um, where it's located. And of course, there's a there will be somebody's name there that they can ask questions to. Blah blah blah. And the time period for all of that. So, uh, but yeah, the department can get it out. That's, that's not an issue. And you have a link where you can download the application. Yeah, yeah, all that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So it's two o'clock. Let's uh, let's take about a ten minute break. And uh, I think with, with the business that we have on hand, we should be able to finish on time. Thank you all. All right, we're, we're only missing one of our members, and so we'll uh, give him time to take care of what he's taken care of, and we'll get, get started back. Um, and we're pretty close to being uh, right on time. Uh, we're up to the point where Kurt's going to join us um, and, and talk about a couple of things, uh, the first of which is uh, outside parties' presentations to the uh, Opioid Abatement Council, and then uh, he'll also talk to us um, – uh, are you going to cover the needs assessment, Kurt? Yeah. Uh, he's going to cover the needs assessment. And, Brian, this gets back to the question that we talked about uh, during the break. All right, Kurt. Thank you, Dr. Lloyd. Thank you all for having me. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about our regional and statewide planning and policy council system and the needs assessment that they conduct annually. Uh, I first want to recognize a couple of our members of our Region 6 uh, Planning and Policy Council, Lynn Julian is the chair, and Megan Gaylord is the vice chair. And th they will become a p uh, a important and apparent in just a second. Um, as you all know, Public Chapter 491 of 2021 that created this council um, requires or directs the council before making any decisions about how to distribute funds to hear and receive input from the Department of Statewide Planning and Policy Council of a needs assessment process, which is conducted with the assistance of the seven regional planning and policy councils. I read that sentence, which y'all are probably wondering of three questions. One, what's a statewide planning and policy council? Two, what's a regional planning and policy council? And three, what is their needs assessment process? So I want to go through those really quickly in the next five to ten minutes so y'all can get on with your meeting. Um, next slide, please. So... <coughs> I'm going to start with the Regional Planning and Policy Council, which you see here on this map. The state is divided into seven regions. Right now, you are in the heart of Region 6 that Lynn and Megan represent. Each of these regions are made up of the people in those communities that know the mental health and substance use issues by their heart. They're in it. They're doing it every day. Um, and they communicate, they share resources, they share ideas, and every year they complete a needs assessment. Now, of those seven regional councils, the vice chairs and chairs serve on the statewide council that, instead of having a regional kind of outlook of the needs, um, have a statewide bent to what they're trying to accomplish. Um, also, ex officio officers from Department of Education, Human Services, so on, participate on that statewide council as well as some people who are preeminent on their field in their field. So that's the regional and statewide councils. The needs assessment process is the probably the most important thing that these regional and statewide councils do each year. Um, as you can see here, it's an annual process and it um, assesses need. Um, in order to prioritize the programming of the department. The department 
uses these needs that are identified by the regions and the statewide councils um, in part to create our three-year plan, which is a plan that we update annually. And this whole process, this needs assessment process, is overseen by our Office of Planning at the department, and the director um, of that office, Avis Easley, is an amazingly organized individual with a team that is very sharp and makes sure that the needs that are, direct, that are um, expressed by each region and the statewide planning and policy council is um, presented in a way that the department um, folks and the people outside of the department can understand what is actually needed in each area of the state. Um, there are three, okay, so let me talk about the process. Each spring, the regional councils as well as the statewide councils committees, they have an adult committee, a children's committee, and a consumer advisory board that we partner with work independently to identify these needs. We ask them to provide us with three mental health needs and three substance use needs each year. They support these needs with data, and then that we turn that, um, they usually turn that into, into us around middle of April. We turn that around, Avis and her team does, into a needs assessment summary. Right now, if you go to our website, and Mary has the link to this, I believe it links in this program, in this uh, presentation. Yep. Let's cross your fingers. To the 2022 needs assessment summary. You'll see on here um, an abundance of needs. Um, even if it doesn't pop up, you can go and visit that on our website. And each region and the statewide committees have said, in Region 6, we need this. In Region 1, we need this. Children statewide need these types of services, um, so on and so forth. So you see all those, they're all supported by data from those communities. Another thing that we do on the website is we, and I'll go over in just a second, is we provide a multi-needs by region um, document, which addresses needs that pop up multiple times across various regions. So you get a real good sense of what are some of the preeminent needs across the state? What are some of the needs that every region or a lot of the regions are having? And then the last document that is really important, one that we've uh, started doing the last few years, is a department update to how the department is addressing those needs. So what I would submit to you is the needs assessment process, the needs assessment documents that we've gone over here today and that we'll go over in, the, in depth in just a second, provide you all with a great guide for what is happening in the communities that y'all are trying to impact. It's already done. You know, a lot of, some people might pay a lot of money to have a needs assessment done for them. This is already baked in. We're already doing this. And I think um, the AG's office in consulting with us when we were writing the bill um, really thought that was something that would be useful to this council to use. Y'all aren't bound by it, but it's certainly a great tool. Let's go to the next slide, the 2022 needs assessment, multi-regions needs. Now I'll bring this to your attention. This is just related to substance abuse or substance use needs. Um, and these are, and you can see underneath each bullet point, the regional councils that identified this need in 2022. Um, and this was one that, this need right here, the first one, for example, for example increased funding slash number of and access to residential and detox beds for adults and children. You can see that five regional councils identified that as a need. That's probably pretty good to know for, for y'all wanting to disperse some money. Um, you also see, and this I think is also important to y'all's process, is this is a need that's been identified not just in 2022, but every year since 2016. Now, <coughs> asterisk at the bottom of this slide, this doesn't mean that the department hasn't tried to address this need, we have. And a lot of these needs have been put in the budget and we've been very blessed by the governor and the legislature to have funding around these issues. Some of these issues are evergreen. They're gonna be things that this money that y'all have could be used to actually <coughs> tackle those kind of things and maybe, just maybe, put them to bed. The second need that was identified by multiple regions, increased prevention and school-based programs for at-youth 
our at-risk youth, again, identified over multiple years. Again, something the department has tried to address, and again, something that multiple regions and statewide count committees have identified as a continuing issue. And the last one, increase in recovery housing. Um, again, multiple, multiple year issue. Again, multiple councils still say that that is an issue. And um, that's really, uh, we feel like these, this needs assessment, the needs assessment, pro needs assessment process is something that y'all could really use to help supplement y'all's thinking around the decision making y'all are going to be uh, doing. Um, that's really all I had to <coughs> share. I kept it to five, 10 minutes. Yeah, thank, thanks, Kurt. Anybody have any I've got a couple of, does anybody have any questions for Kurt around this? I, I don't have any question, but if uh, Mary could share that document with us uh, so we could look at it. And the first thing that jumped out whenever she had it pulled up briefly was the need for mental health professionals, which is really huge. So. The other thing is that we write a very detailed needs with data based on the region, like having written these for the past several years. It might also be helpful to you to even see in these needs assessments that we put forward very specific programming that we're suggesting, whether it's like bringing up adolescent detox. There is one single detox facility in the entire state for adolescents, and it's in West Tennessee. So it doesn't help kids in East Tennessee. It doesn't help kids in Minnesota. It doesn't help kids. So that was something that we talked about in one of them. And those sometimes individual proposals might also help us too when looking at allocation of funding. And a lot of that information is going to be included in the summary. But yeah, if that's something you don't want to look at, please let us know. Thanks, man. I was uh, I was going back to mine in your conversation this morning. You know, when we look at the remediation list, it's what's been signed off on by the powers that be that, that participated in the lawsuit. But then there's our individual specific needs in the state of Tennessee. And and I think this is a great guide and a great tool for us because this is basically the regions of the state saying that, hey, if we had some money, this is what this is where we need it. And I think we've got to listen to that. And the thing that jumped off the page to me was recovery housing. I mean, I see that uh, every day. And if you look at the number of years that it was a need, it, it looked like it went back to prehistoric times. And, and so it's been there for, for a long time. So, I, I, you know, I, I would recommend, you know, this council that, that, you know, that we take that into consideration as to what the folks in our state who live and work in these communities, that's what you just told us they did. Mm -hmm. And they understand their needs, and, 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 and we use that in, in you know, in, in, in trying to direct this money. When I was with the state, I always dreamed of this, okay, $10 million falls out of the sky, what can you do with it? Right, that kind of thing. Well, it kind of has fallen out of the sky, although to a lot of blood and death. But uh, but now, I mean, I think these are opportunities for us to kind of put these things to bed. And when I think about recovery housing, there's a lot of issues around that. It's the Wild West when it comes to that. And and I'm going to use some of my time next time to talk just a little bit about recovery housing, and we'll, we'll talk about the next meeting here in, in just a little bit. But, Kurt, thank you. And I'll, if I could add one other thing, we're starting the needs assessment for 2023 right now. They're in the midst of it. Each regional council and the statewide county committees, our council committees. So hopefully by mid-May, end of May, we will have a 2023 needs assessment summary to share with y'all. But right now, the 2022, those are issues that are near and dear to the people in the community seeing what they need. Michelle, could you go back two slides to where it had the numbers for the assessment? Thank you. We do that for the mental health needs as well, but for the purposes of this presentation, Mary and I thought it was best for y'all to see the substance use related needs. It's not all the rhetoric coming from, and it's, it's all well intended, I get it, but it's interesting that, that prevention and school-based programs for at-risk youth is up there. And so I mean, that, these are kind of things that we're talking about that, you know, that, you know, from the public health standpoint, the more money that you invest over here in, in prevention, the bigger your ROI on, on the right side. And as you move right in that down to, you know, treatment, well, treatment's still a good thing to invest your money in, but your ROI is not near what it is in prevention. And so I'm glad that this is what we continue here, but in my experience, a lot of times we blow it off. And, and that's just honest. So uh, I really appreciate this, and I appreciate you presenting it to us, Kurt. Thank you. Thank you.
I have a question, Steve. Yes, uh, is, Dr. That, Dr. is that needs assessment something that we can, um, that the council would potentially want to include on our council website so that uh, granting uh, institutions or applicants may be aware of what actually is needed? And is it something that we as a council need to just use as a guideline or is there some form of formal way of incorporating it as a consideration? I can say that when the department creates its three-year plan, we feel that it's important because we want the feedback that these regions and the councils provide us that we make a special notation in our three-year plan if, if a program or goal that we've adopted was inspired by a regional or a statewide council committee need. So something that y'all possibly could do as you are um, dispersing the funds is just say, hey, this is why we did this, is because the needs assessment pointed us to this need. Does that help? Personally, I, I like this on our website as part of the application process. For me, if I'm looking at making an impact here, I'd like to see what we currently need, what the data of our state shows us need, what the region that I'm living in says that these are the things that are needed. So, I mean, I would think that this would be something that would be appropriate for our website. Is that, uh, do you think so as well? Nothing prevents us from doing that? Not at all. We, we'd be happy to, to let you all link to it. Do you have any kind of data that shows us what you have uh, allocated for these needs and any kind of results that you have seen from allocations from your department to these? Yeah, absolutely. On, on that three-year plan, we do February and August reports each year um, that, that um, we look at KPIs and then we say how we're hitting those KPIs in February and August, and that's available on our website too, and I can share that with Mary. I think that would be helpful. So the, the council needs to consider two things here, and we'll, we'll need motions uh, to do this. So the first one is the frequency to hear updates like Kurt just gave us. And then the second thing we'll need to vote on is the method to receive that information. And, and uh, I guess we want to roll that into one motion. That would be uh, fine with me. So you update this every year despite it being a three-year plan, correct? Correct. So uh, if I can make a recommendation for you all to mm -hmm. then recommend. But uh, maybe come for y'all uh, and give an update about our newest um, needs assessment summary um, in your late summer meeting, anytime past late May. Mm -hmm. I think we would have the information gathered by that point. Our second meeting of next year should be after late May. So okay. Okay. That's when I would say you would get the, the best update from it. And then the frequency going forward, uh, would you say yearly would be a good thing? Okay. And are you willing to do it? If y'all have Jerry, uh, Jason's deli, yeah. Yeah. then absolutely. All right. So you've heard Kurt's, uh, Kurt's input on this, so uh, I'll entertain any motions. I love what he said, so I'll move to the, use what he said. Are you going to make me restate that? So. Uh, so I think uh, I think the good mayor is is saying that uh, he moves that uh, that Kurt come on a yearly basis uh, in person and uh, starting at our second meeting uh, of the year uh, as long as it's after May and I think it will be looking at the calendar. So, so, so got a or got a, a motion. I, I guess that can be a second from Brian. Any discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. All right, motion carries. Kurt, we will see you in June. Yeah, sounds All great. All right, thank you. So the next one is for input from community stakeholders. So this is on uh, the county grant application okay. project. Now this is the second part of uh, getting input from council, getting input to make a decision for the disbursement of funds. So they also need to allow for Oh yeah, the second part of it. Yeah, how do we go about that? So yeah, there's there's two parts to this. The second part is is how do we go about allowing comment and input from community stakeholders, local governments, state and local public health officials, public health advocates, law enforcement, judiciary representatives, opioid remediation service providers, and other parties interested and actively involved in in addressing the opioid crisis and its abatement. If I'm completely honest, I don't understand all that. Uh, so, is, what's what's the intent here? Um, 
again, education, so learning, hearing from other folks across the state, um, what, what, I mean, it's kind of similar to the Planning and Policy Council that needs assessment, but it would be more on an individual or an agency basis or an advocacy group, just the general community. How would y'all want to hear um, presentations or information? What other folks would like to present to the council? Well, these are open meetings <laughs> to the public, right? So, I mean, we, we have one mechanism already, <coughs> already open. That's that is informal, but I'm assuming we have concerned citizens all around the room that we can hear from, and we do want to hear from them. And uh, our chair has been good at every meeting to ask if there's any public comment um, for those who do not have the ability to to uh, be in person at the meeting. I'm assuming that the the uh, Teams account is also available for those that have Wi-Fi access um, or cellular access that's good enough to get on the meeting. Um, so that's one avenue that is available. Um, what other means would we for? <coughs> well, we said last time that we do not, uh, as Judge Seckler said, we do not want to have formal presentations. To, it could take so long of a time that you can't control them. And so I think the mechanism we have is pretty good. Yeah, yeah Timothy, and I think, what, and also what Stephanie brought up last time about that is that whenever you have formal presentations, then then sometimes it becomes about the quality of the presenter rather than the quality of your program, which I think is 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 outstanding. And I was just looking around the room and Clay said that, just the people I know, and we've got community stakeholders, we've got at least two statewide organizations, including the TMA and our county guy, David, uh, we've got uh, remediation service providers, of which there are at least four of in this room that I know of, and I don't think anybody here uh, is here because they're not interested. So um, I don't think anybody shows up something they're not interested in, although I could be wrong. So do we need another mechanism besides that? Because it was the same way at our meeting in Knoxville, and in all honesty, it was the same way at our meeting uh, in Nashville, our very first one in July. I honestly feel like once the press release is hit, <coughs> and people go to the website, figure out who's on the council. I think some of us are gonna become more popular than we already are. <laughs> <laughs> Your neighbor's gonna have a proposal. Um, I, mean, I, I, I think attendance at the meetings may be more robust as we begin <clears throat> handing out dollars. I mean, we're not gonna stay on this committee 18 years, right. but it's over 40 million per committee member. So I feel richer than I've ever felt. I mean, <laughs> spending other people's money, but um, I believe that attendance at our meetings, once we start allocating dollars, will will go up. And and uh, I just think it's important for all of us to communicate externally. And Shane's done a good job of saying we we need to know how to communicate externally too. To communicate externally, that to Sunshine State, we want Tennesseans at the meetings. We want community input. We want advocacy input. And uh, that that. We're open to that engagement at our meetings. I, I think people will come. And, I'd like to encourage our council members to, when you get calls uh, from people in your community, invite them to our meetings. They can join virtually. <coughs> we've got virtual. Uh, we've got virtual participants on on there today. There are multiple people in this room today that I invited, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And if we need a bigger space, then we need a bigger space. <coughs> so I guess my question to the council is: Do we need another mechanism besides what we already have? Are these meetings recorded? Mm -hmm. I am recording this for minutes. Okay. Yeah. Would they be public accessible at a later time? Uh, I need to check with the legal team on that. I don't know. I would prefer they not be. Um, the minutes, I think, are fine. But we may, but there's a credibility piece. And so ABC XYZ entity uh, sends something to us. And Tommy says, no, I arrested that guy last year, and I don't want to give them money. <laughs> we, that would create, I mean, we need to know that if he did, but that would create a legal challenge for us uh, under libel or. Are you thinking candor? Yeah. Candor. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Candor, the, yeah. Just talk at the end. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's one that we know we have non voting members here in public, but when something goes digital and it exists in perpetuity, I think people truncate the conversation a different way. So we're not we're not recording this for the public. 
it will be I, I have to check it's with an our, internal document to help you prepare the minutes. I, I need to check with our attorneys on that. There may be something within the sunshine law that we have to respect, but I'll get back to you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just a thought sorry. So, so I'm sorry, Ken. I, I, I like the idea of just having a public comment period. You know, the you know I'm an, elect, an elected official, and that's typically how we do it. We don't allow PowerPoint presentations at our board meetings from outside entities. We do allow public comment, and sometimes, depending on the number of people that want to speak, we may have to limit that time frame. Uh, there may be occasions that uh, people bring something to us at some of these public meetings and alphabet soup organizations that I'm part of that we may want to hear more, and then staff would research that and decide about whether a more formal presentation might be in order. I think we need to build that into our processes for public dissemination. I, that goes toward the point I was talking about last time. If we, my bet is a particular XYZ entity comes in, files an application, they will be here the night. Somebody will be here the night that they that we vote on that, and we need to be aware of that. Yeah. And sometimes they come in mass. I mean, it it can it can become unwieldy if we don't have some some safeguard. And for that matter, with respect to candor, although we may not be recording to re-release the public, anybody who's ever done online dating knows that anybody can record anything. So, I mean, someone from the public may be recording us right now, and my snarky comments may be released tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Jackson should be removed. He never takes anything seriously. You know what I mean? I, I think we all need to be aware that we live in a digital age. We all <laughs> And so, uh, you know, any any member of the public could release verbatim our mannerisms and all of that because they could be recording it on their phone, audio or audio visual. So, I think that that is is worth mentioning. A question uh, for you, Mary: do, uh, do we have a mechanism for public comment on our website uh, where people can, pa you know, send us information passively and then we can collect that? You know, like a I mean, Facebook group has that idea, but I mean, just can we collect, could, could they, do you have a comment and they can click a button and, and we can get that? No, we don't have that option right now, but I, I imagine that could be built out if that's something y'all would be interested in. Yeah. I would be because it's fairly painless. It doesn't take any of our time, mm -hmm. but if somebody's really got something to say, one more mechanism is if Mary Lou can't get here from Alaska, that she could, she could you know, have something, and, and then obviously somebody's job needs to turn, read mm -hmm. it. And if it's if mm -hmm. it's if we feel like it, it's, it needs to be addressed to the committee, hey, here's something we didn't think about, or we got 32 comments last week about pediatric beds or or, or whatever. And if X Y Z organization has that much clout yeah. that they can get 42 people to flood our website, then hey, it's important to 42 people, yeah. and that way we give a grassroots ability to people to influence the thoughts of the committee in a way that doesn't involve a PowerPoint here. There's, there's a couple of things I like from this discussion. Uh, one is, is to have a time set aside at the end of our agenda before public comment specifically for this subgroup of people with the caveat that we can limit it and, and then uh, close with public comment. And then the, 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 the next thing is having a, a mechanism on our website where people can comment from the public. I think those are uh, two really good avenues, and I would uh, I would put those forward for consideration. I don't, to me, I don't see anything that we need outside of that right now. And of course, we can always change going forward if the, you know, the need uh, presents itself. Are you making that in the form of a motion for us? To vote? I'd like somebody else to, but yes. <laughs> what's, what's the motion again? What, what is it? Well, well, it would. I would. Re just listening to the discussion, um, a separate uh, a separate uh, agenda item that's spelled out on our agenda for for these this specific group as outlined just by that, and then to be followed just by public comment. So that's one, and then second is a place on our website for public comment, literally anytime. Make that motion. Second. All right, we got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, the motion carries. So we have multiple mechanisms. Uh, and then the county grantee application submission process. All right. So in order to disperse the first payment to the counties by early uh, quarter, 
one was it tw uh, one Q1 2023 can't read the council chair and executive director are proposing using platforms and systems currently available within the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuses uh, and the state of Tennessee so we talked about this actually at the last meeting and decided not to reinvent the wheel this money is coming directly from the the fund administrator to the counties and we're talking about using existing things within the department to distribute that fund so we don't have to worry about it any other way. So you can be, feel free to read those one, two, three, four, five points on there that outlines it. You can read those yourself, and uh, we'll have a, a motion if somebody's ready or discussion, whatever you all see fit. We actually spelled these out at our last meeting. Sorry, I just have a quick question. Now, are they required to use the Appendix E strategies, or do they have leeway? They, they, have, they have leeway. Okay. They have leeway. Understood. We, there's not any restriction. Right. Uh, I was in North Carolina, and, and so I, in, in the, since our last meeting, I went to some other states to see what their approaches are. North Carolina is somebody that I've been looking at. Colorado is somewhere else. And uh, there was a county in North Carolina that uh, used their money to, to, to buy some new police cars. Huh. So, and, and, and they have that right. And, and if that's what they see that they need, then yeah, absolutely. So they don't have to do, um, I'm sorry, they don't have to do the application, like for the state money, they can just cut checks? It's just coming directly to them okay. through, the, through the fund. So we will have a certification mm -hmm. uh, process. So they'll certify that they'll use the remediation list. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a letter of agreement between the Department of Mental Health and the county, and then also agree to some very minimum reporting requirements. And David, do you have anything that you'd like to say? Well, I'll just say, uh, David Connor with the County Services Association, the confusion in a lot of this is the different pots of money. Because there is money that's flowing right now to the county outside of what you all see. That's what I was talking about. And, yeah, and that money is unrestricted. A lot of them are looking at ways to invest it on remediation. Um, the money that you all will be sending to them would be in conjunction with that. Thank, thanks, David. I was going to recognize David uh, here in a second because I wanted to update. We'll, we'll, I'll close with it. But thank you, David. So the money I was talking about that's unrestricted is the money that's coming directly from, from the fund administrator to the counties. We don't have involvement. They go straight. Uh, this money is that 35% portion uh, that, that we're talking about that, that will allocate to the counties that they have to use the remediation list. And we're just looking at a process. Uh, I think as Clay <coughs> presented is we're trying to not be Brett Favre. So, you know, that it's going to go to, to, you know, very minimal, but this is what we're asking for is outlined in, in the five things here. I move approval. Okay, we've got to move for approval on the proposed process. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, all right. Opposed? <clears throat> all right, the motion carries. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, double back a little bit because there are a few other things we need to vote on, although I think we've already, uh, we've already talked about it. I got excited that, uh, that we got a process in place, but we need, to, we need a uh, motion to, uh, on the timeline. That we're talking about that, that was proposed uh, that, that Shane laid out, uh, and we'll we'll tackle that one uh, that one first. But I want to just whip through the timeline real quick. To get the hypothetical proposed a February 28th of next year. Looking forward to a four to five months, depending on how you're counting the days. So I think the, the actual payout day would be six and a half months afterward. Uh, that was we'll call it arbitrary. It comes from some anecdotal situations. But we need to build enough time in for us and for the grantee uh, for any feedback that we want from them over above and beyond the application and for us to do our due diligence and, and come up with the right type of approach on each of these grants. And again, we talked about the subcommittee time. We had a vetting time internal, a subcommittee review. That subcommittee comes back to the full group and that's where the, that's where the vote is done. Uh, that's going to take some time, and that's why we, you know, we built in five or six months to do that. But, you know, that's just a suggestion. So. Mary, do you mind going back to that slide and showing the the timeline slide that Shane is referring to? And the system that I'm looking at using will not be available until July, just yeah, because that, they have to do the customization. Yeah, the challenge. Uh, I I think that. <laughs> Once the start date's tripped, the, the timing 
that you've laid out is great. Say, my concern is February 28th is going to be here very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Hanukkah time and Ho Ho time and everything else. And we, you know, Tommy wants us to look at what the state already has. We've agreed <clears throat> to do that. And then how we mesh what we put up here that we voted on and agreed on with what the state has, get something in. We're saying the deadline's February 28th. And we still haven't sent a letter to everybody to let them know we're going to have money. I, I understand the state's going to be mad and everybody's going to be mad if next December 31st we're still sitting on these dollars. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think I th my view is today we should vote on the timeline from Start. day zero to you know, the process. <clears throat> and in the starting point, I don't think we have enough information today to set a first deadline because I don't know, with due respect, that we know at, at your office how we're going to put this into a state. Can I suggest we go back one slide then and then vote on that slide? Because that's the slide that has a blank timeline. So yeah. the application deadline would be a certain date with the initial vetting ending 30 days after the application deadline, the subcommittee review being an additional 30 days and the full OAC decision 45 days. I propose that we vote on this timeline, removing the February 28th date, but there is an application deadline of X and then 30 days, 30 days and 45 days after that would be our ideal subcommittee, I mean our ideal committee timeline to approve applications and fund. So, Stephanie, essentially the February 28th just becomes XXXX and then uh, plus 30 days, plus 30 days, plus 45 days. Yes, yeah, so we're voting on time intervals, not a specific date, a start date. And I, I, think that, I, think that that's, I think that that's reasonable uh, looking at what our challenge is and the fact that we do need to follow up on the things that the state already has in place. And we also have to talk about a funding announcement timeline. So uh, is, that, uh, is that your motion, Shane? Yes. Essentially... Taking this timeline, the February 28th just becomes X's, and we're voting on the intervals that we'll put in place when we have uh, an announcement date. So the start date open. Okay, second. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? All right, the motion carries. Um, and on the next slide, Steve, I just wanted to highlight one more thing that we may not vote on today, but we need to consider before we vote again, and that is the estimated total available for funding and the number of awards. I don't think that's something that's in the purview of this council in the time remaining, in the purview of this um, for us to discuss in the time we have remaining, but we should decide on it before we make the funding announcement. Um, that may be a discussion we have to take offline, but um, we'll need to be as clear as possible to the applicants so they know what they're applying for. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Stephanie. I mean, we need to we need to think about that. I don't think we're at the point to do it today. I think we've got a process in place. I think there's some things we need to follow up on. So I think it it, it is offline and it's agenda item for our next meeting. Mr. That, Chair, would you like to vote on large cap or small cap? You want to save that for the next? Oh, yeah. You want to bundle that? I was going to save it all. Fine. That's okay. <laughs> Unless somebody feels differently. There are two things that we do need to uh, uh, do need to talk about. Is uh, let's see, we already got that to the counties. Um, this is for the county money. Uh, does the council wish to develop rules and time limitations for the use of medication assisted therapies in treating OUD that are paid for through the fund? So these are the county monies, 35%. We will okay. If it involves MAT, does this council wish to develop rules and time limitations for the medication uh, assisted therapies when treating OUD? No. Why would we reconstitute the work of the state medical board? Professional associations. I don't want to get in the regulation business. So they're already just so just for everybody's edification, and we're going to address this at our next meeting with some uh, general education of everybody on the council. But there are already a buprenorphine rules uh, for clinics that they have more than a certain number of patients or the percentages more than a certain percentage that they have to follow the rules, and they are uh, audited by the state on that with state investigators in the three grand subdivisions, <laughs> and they are held accountable. They are given. Uh, 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 warnings, they're given, uh, what, what's the demerits, not demerits, what do yeah. they call it? citations? Yeah. Citations that they have to follow up on. That process is already in place. So we had that one first. What people did was they didn't violate those numbers, so they didn't have to be licensed. So we came back and got them with prescribing guidelines. So the individual prescribers also have to meet 
those same uh, those same guidelines. So what Clay is saying is that let's leave uh, up to the process what's already in place. Just so you know that they do are they are required to talk about tapering medication within both the rules and guidelines in the state. So if you are prescribing uh, MAT in any form, at least every six months you have to discuss. Uh, moving towards uh, uh, medication reduction and uh, moving towards abstinence. And whenever the state audits you, that, that is something that's looked at in documentation of your notes. So is everybody comfortable with uh, allowing uh, the state to enforce the rules that are already in effect from a clinic guideline and, and or I'm sorry, clinic rule and a prescriber guideline perspective? Yes. Can I ask a question? In terms of the, the rule, does it address uh, wrap around clinical services as as a part of that uh, as well. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a big part of it. Yeah. We spent well, we spent a long time on that, didn't we, Kurt? And uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. So, yeah. uh, are there people who pencil whip that and skirt it? Yes. Uh, but 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 you know the process is is that that we're eventually going to get them. Yeah. And and they're going to have to do those things. So uh, th those are already in place. So it's, it's not defined. just writing medication. Right. All right, and then uh, let's see, does the council wish to create a timeline for monies paid to the counties to revert back to the opioid treatment fund if they are not used within a certain period by a county? We give you dollars, uh, it's been this long and you hadn't spent any of them or you've only spent a small portion of them as we track this every, every six months. We should. Yeah. I think so. Ken, you're lord of a city. I'd like to hear. I mean, it, 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 seems, it seems practical to me if we use money. If you can't spend it in two years, we take it back. Well, I, I would stipulate that if my county mayor doesn't spend it within two years, it'll automatically go to the city. So, <laughs> like I, I think probably either two or three years would be a reasonable time to, for them to figure out what they're going to do with it. We may not exist after two years, so I think we should uh, say two. I, I agree. <laughs> That's also going to fall within some of the guidelines that are already established in the state rules and whether or not an extension should be provided or granted. You know, there could be some exigent circumstances that the... Yeah, why don't we just say that you, you can apply for an extension? So, Tommy, in, with, with what you just said, do we need to table this one until we look at what the state... I, I got you. Is everybody okay with that? Yes. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> All right, there's a problem with that. <laughs> so we won't be able to disperse the funds uh, um, until we get this settled. So if the counties are, are presenting stuff to us with this documentation, it's going to hold that up. I'd move two years with the ability to apply for an extension and also make sure that it's consistent with state law. And if it's not consistent with state law, the state law would override. Second. Second. Discussion? Or establish grant guidelines that are adopted by this committee or the state. If it's already, if you already, you already have it in the guidelines, then we can, we can simply, we can go to the two-year maximum, whatever the terms granted at this committee, we're going to have terms on these grants anyway. Mm -hmm. And so whatever is already there, as so long as it's compliant with the state, the adopted state guidelines that are already established. Okay. Is that different from what Ken said? It's exactly what I said. Okay, all right. Yeah, I'm good. So we're going to agree that, that a combination of that is our motion. Yes, all right. Clay, do you still second it? It'll come out in minutes. Um, I think so. Tom, is what you said what Ken said? It is. A two year would be the max term. Right. And then, unless within the established guidelines that are already there at the state, if they allow for, you can go for a three-year grant. I mean, there are many grants we oh, set the well, term. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not a different. it's not a timed grant. It is a it's a payment. That's, that's why I said. That's okay, thank you, Karen. Uh -huh. right. I was like, yeah, so I'm confused now. Yeah, so it is a payment. It's not a grant. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, so if we could use what Ken is saying, I think, yeah. David, do you? Yeah. I'm sorry. Jessica, we make, we're dealing with this with ARP funds right now. Do you want a deadline on how quickly it's allocated versus how quickly it's spent? Allocation. Allocation. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's a good point. Yeah. So, because some a county might say, we're going to pay this jail over a 10-year period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, allocation, I think, is a better word than spend. So, that they haven't spent it within the two years, do they have to revert it back? 
I think there should be initial applications. What we're dealing with with ARP is you've got to the end of 24 to allocate it, the end of 2016. No, okay. But if it's Getting a long term project, like I'm thinking about what we're oh, yeah. doing up there in Carter County, yeah. there you go. they're building a residential treatment facility. Just going out as they trouble getting contracts for 10 years. You don't want to have a thing that was like, oh, we thought it was going to be built in 18 no, months. I, I saw it on there and then I just totally forgot. Oh, because okay. I knew she was going to be there, and so I didn't think about, like, oh, she's not there, so we have to take notes. You know what I mean? To the terms of that, you would really run into a contractual issue if that county or that city already agreed to something under contract. You could really put them in a pickle. So well, I, I, I mean, the caveat is the expiry extension. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nobody saw COVID coming. Okay. So how long we should, we should have, at the end of two years, you should be able to say, reason. here's why we haven't allocated slash spent this money. I like the word allocated. Did they really? Plus, it puts in a system of, of accountability for for them because if they they get to that two year guideline and they've they've not spent anything and they've got a project that they've planned for that's going to take X amount of time, then they can come back and say, I need this extension for this reason. Could you restate your motion, Kim, for the second? Complimentary. I know what we're voting on. Uh, I'd recommend that uh, the, the county. Uh, allocate ha have two years to allocate the funding that we're sending them uh, and that there is an opportunity for them to apply for an extension uh, and also that it uh, be compliant with state statute is that correct the statute um, or regulation a regulation do, do we really have to put put that I mean should that not be understood uh, that seems to I, I understand, but well, I know, I mean, but we're just like we're saying you better do this. I mean, yeah, you better do that. We, I don't know that we have to put that language in, in this when it should just be understood. You follow the guidelines. I mean, now maybe I'm naive about how these things work, but I, I'm from a law side, I'm thinking I shouldn't have to tell you to, to abide by the law. So let me tell you what Tarn and I are discussing behind the scenes over here in her experience is that you've got an allocation that you've got, you've got two years to allocate it and then two years to spend it with an opportunity to uh, apply for a, an extension. Just leave it at that. Yep. Clay's shaking his head, I think. I couldn't tell. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> on a second. I know. I know you, I, I'm sorry. I, it, it, a little bit, it's hard to understand. I mean, particularly not a lawyer, and I've got a judge over here saying, shouldn't that be understood, which just totally freaks me out from everything that I've learned in my life. So, I think, yeah, yeah. Example. Do an example, yeah, so, so the example is that you've got this amount of money, and you're going to, you get it allocated for a project that's going to go forward for, uh, you know, three years. And, and so you, you, you've, a, you've allocated that money right up front. Now we get to the two-year standpoint, you've still got money out there that hadn't been spent yet, but it's been allocated to so you meeting, so you have another two years to spend it. But if you get to the end of that four years from the original time, then now you have the opportunity to apply for an extension because the contractor that you contracted with couldn't get the building built or whatever it is. And then we have the opportunity to say yay or nay based on that, on that extension request of getting the money spent. So two years to allocate, two years to spend with an opportunity to apply for an extension. That way you don't allocate it at two years and you're still holding on to it 16 years later. <laughs> Does that make sense? Or can somebody form that into a, a motion besides me? Can. <laughs> the toe. <laughs> All right. So we have a motion on the floor. I mean, by... Ken's motion is on the floor, so nobody else can bring up the money. We either have to amend his motion. Well, I, I would well, my former on. motion and say ditto to uh, Chairman Lloyd's. Uh, are you okay with that motion? Yes. I, I don't know how many times I can look. I don't think Steve could officially put forth a motion. I can't. I think he can. So I think you have to say it. <laughs> but you said it. I recommend that the allocation be for a period of two years, uh, and it can be extended for an additional two years. And a um, uh, uh, under certain circumstances can I don't like that uh, at the discretion discretion of the at the discretion of the of the, of the council yeah the discretion of the council may be extended thank you two years to allocate two years to spend yeah. 
send us a letter if you can't do that. Yep. That's the motion. Do I have a second? Second. <coughs> we got a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, uh, for the record, we just spent seven minutes debating if politicians can spend money in four years. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Make, it, make a note of that. <laughs> All right, so the motion carries. Um, our, our last couple of things I, I wanted just to give you a, a quick update on some of mine and Mary's activities, and we've got David Connor here behind us. Um, called him the county guy. David is actually, that's not his official title. Uh, David is, uh, is the uh, executive director of the Tennessee County Services Association. Uh, we met with him uh, about a month ago, I guess it was, and in January and February, I think it is, uh, we're going to do a webinar uh, with the county mayors and any interested parties on activities of this council and how we can better uh, serve the counties of the uh, of state of Tennessee. Is that correct, David? Yeah, and just I think walk through some of your thoughts, you know, the ecosystem, some of the resources and tools that are out there to help them make good decisions about how to and now that we've had Kurt come in and, and help us with the with the state's three-year plan and the needs assessment, so we have that as well, so we'll be sure and cover that. So I want to make sure you all know what our activities are. The last order of business is uh, decide on when and where of our next meeting. Uh, we have a recommendation and an offer from uh, from Ken of using uh, the boardroom in Franklin, Tennessee, since we uh, you know probably need to be back in Middle Tennessee. That's where we started. Uh, so I would I put that forth, but we need to decide when. So it needs to be in the first quarter of next year. And so if everybody has their calendars, we'll try to come up with a, uh, a decent date there. Probably need a little bit of flexibility to make sure mm -hmm. that there's no conflict for the usage of the boardroom. Okay. So first quarter is January, February, and March. So could we look at February 20th and February 27th? Is, is a is a two week period uh, can good enough? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we look at February 20th or February 27th, depending on availability of uh, of uh, of the boardroom. 20th is President's yes, Day. Yes, 20th is President's Day. Yeah, 20th is right. President's Day. All right. So we got the 27th then. On March 6th. 27th and March 6th. And Mary and I will work with my assistant to okay. confirm that quickly. And also need to check with Commissioner Williams' calendar, too. So those are our two proposed dates. We'll do it based on availability of the boardroom, and we will do it uh, in uh, Franklin. Thank you, Ken, for offering. All right. What was the date again? They're going to check with February 27th, February 27th or and March. March 6th. All right. We, uh, do we have any public comment? All right, thanks to everyone for coming, and we stand adjourned. <laughs>